Good morning, everyone. Um, we're about ready to get started with our first panel of the day. Um, this panel is uh, entitled Perspectives on Housing Risk, um, and we're very, very fortunate to have three distinguished um, uh, panelists uh, from the academic world with us today. Um, I'll briefly introduce them. The bios give a lot more detail than I will, but uh, let me mention at the beginning, um, we're also pleased that all three have connections to AEI. Morris is an adjunct scholar, and as you heard yesterday, is doing work with Ed and me on a variety of projects. Um, Susan and Stan are both members of the Academic Council for our Center on Housing Risk, and we really appreciate their participation in that way. So um, the three members of our panel are, are Morris. Uh, to, to begin, um, Morris was uh, very uh, humble yesterday in talking about um, <laughs> his own credentials. Um, he's uh, not only uh, been an economist at, at the Fed um, and a professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin, he's now um, building up a new real estate center at Rutgers University. And uh, knowing Morris and how entrepreneurial it is, I, I think you'll be hearing about this center much more in coming years. Um, Stan is um, professor of finance and director of the Center for Real Estate Finance Research at NYU. Um, is a prolific author, um, and I know we'll be talking today about a variety of topics, including um, the future for the GSEs. And Susan um, is a professor of real estate and finance at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, also a very prolific researcher in the area of housing and mortgage markets, and looking forward to the comments from all three of them. So we'll start with Morris, go to Stan, um, and go to Susan. Each one will have up to 15 minutes to present their comments, um, and then we'll uh, go to Q&A after that. Thanks, it's, it's really great to be here. I just wanna say, um, this is the fourth one. I've been to three of these conferences, and I thought yesterday's set of presentations was excellent, and I learned a lot, and um, I don't say that frequently. Sometimes I say it politely, but I don't say it frequently. So, um, you know, this was kind of a free form session and um, to talk about housing risk. So what I wanted to talk about was kind of knowledge risk. Um, oftentimes we rush to regulate, or it seems like we rush to regulate based on what we think we know. And then it turns out that what we thought we knew was wrong uh, because we didn't have the data, we didn't have the time to digest the data. And so this, what I thought would be fun was a presentation called Things I Thought I Knew and Things I Think I Know Now and Other Random Thoughts. And uh, that reminded me of some Saturday Night Live sketch, so I included this. I was sort of hoping you'd have this as a handout to keep it, but uh, you don't. So, Okay, so, um, you know, when we were first working on this land research goes back to uh, the early part of 2000s. Um, because Steve and I and others at the Federal Reserve Board recognized that you know, you could think of a house as a car, which could be completely reproduced with a known technology, and some other piece that we called land for shorthand, which would be very hard to reproduce, maybe impossible to reproduce. And the reason we thought at the time it'd be th useful to think about a house like that is because in the event of a demand shock or any kind of shock to housing, you should see more structures the quantity of structure should increase, but not necessarily the price, and you should see the price of land go up. So uh, if you were interested in house price dynamics, ultimately that turns out to be uh, translate to being interested in land price dynamics. So something that I thought at the time was that housing that had a high share of its value attributable to land, so that's called high land share, that would be most susceptible to bubbles. And the reason that I thought that was I was just looking at a very simple accounting equation ship, a, a relationship. House price growth, which is the left-hand side, just arithmetically can be written as the land share, LS, times land price growth, plus whatever's not attributable to land, call that structure, structures, times construction costs. Construction costs rise by roughly the same everywhere. That's not totally true, but in an order of magnitude sense, it's true. So the thought was, well, suppose everywhere has a 10% shock to land prices. 
in, take the first example, let's take a place like Oklahoma City where the land share is low. Um, a 10% shock to land prices should translate to a 1% shock to house prices. If you start with a place like San Francisco where land share is closer to 80%, a 10% shock to land prices might translate to an 8% shock to house prices. So this gets at this thought where if the land shocks are the same everywhere, then house price growth will be most rapid where land share value is high. So why was this wrong? Well, it's wrong because during the boom and the bust, the low land share places had the fastest growth in house prices. And you can, I'm sure you all memorized this graph from Steve's presentation yesterday, but in the event, you've, in the event you forgot to bring it with you, um, the red line shows the basically the least expensive land, or, or it's the land, it's the areas where land accounted for the least share of house value. The black line shows the areas where land accounts for the most share of house value. And you can see the growth to land prices over time was most rapid in the boom in places where land was cheap. So you could argue the land price shocks were most rapid. And that's sometimes why simple accounting can be deceiving. The simple accounting always works, but the assumptions you use sometimes don't. OK. You heard this one a lot if you read the New York Times. I'm guessing at the AEI, I'm sure you read the New York <laughs> Times every day. So. Um, the housing bubble was located in places where housing was inelastically supplied. And this, again, comes from econ a thought from Econ 1. Suppose there's a demand shock out there. The demand shock will have the greatest impact on prices in areas where it is hardest to build. Because there's a demand shock, there's no way to produce more output, so then the price has to adjust. So why was, turns out, why was this wrong? This was wrong because the demand shock was largest in the areas where land was elastically supplied. And so then we're left scratching our heads. How could that have happened? So let me show you a graph. Unfortunately, I don't have a graph of the positive shock to land prices, but I can show you at least the negative shock to land and, by extension, house prices. The dark reds areas are the areas that experienced the greatest decline to house prices. You can call that a negative demand shock, if you like. Um, using simple econ one terms. It's not quite true, but boy, it looks like you can build an awful lot in those areas, so why should their price change? And um, these are the areas that were poor. They're closer to areas where you could build a lot. And you know, so why weren't prices pinned down by construction costs just in general? There shouldn't have been any action in prices in these areas that we would have expected ahead of time. So ultimately, you know, let me draw, maybe in three years, I'll write a slide saying I was wrong three years ago, but um, the conclusions that we're drawing from this as a literature is that this points to the massive role that changes in mortgage finance played, uh, at least along a transition path. And um, Sten's got a lot of work on this, not at this kind of geography, but a lot of work suggesting this occurred, so do other economists. This suggests either government policy or some kind, something changed, deeply changed, that led to a demand shock in poor areas, an outsized demand shock in poor areas, using Federal Reserve terminology. OK. Things I think I know now. I've got a couple slides left, so we're almost done here. Um, federal and state and local policies that promote affordability ultimately raise house prices. Why? Because there's a component of housing that's inelastically supplied, and that's we've called land for shorthand. Economists, every single economic model that you write down, say ultimately a goal for policymakers, if you want to call it that, should be to lower house prices. The reason is that um, it's easier to afford a down payment with low prices. So many of our models home ownership's a good thing, and if you need a down payment and house prices are high, it takes longer to save for a house. So you have more people renting than should, optimally, and uh, high house prices therefore leads to an, um, a lower level of utility than you could achieve with a low house price. So what's going on? Why don't we all strive for low? You know, what's crazy now is we have the federal government sort of actively trying to raise house prices for whatever reason, and uh, I think we're stuck. We can't propose a policy that lowers house prices 
because we are so levered in our own house, and we're all levered in our own house because of current housing policy. So we're trapped. We're trapped in a regime with high house prices. And I'm hoping that Ed and Steve's home loan, well, affordable housing wealth loan, <laughs> wealth, wealth building, building loan, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I, there's too many acronyms now in mortgage finance. The, uh, I'm hoping that once we start to get less levered as a society, maybe with those kinds of mortgages, we can actually talk about reducing house prices rather than propping them up. Here's something I think I know. Uh, the one risk, we talked a lot about federal policy risk yesterday. We talked a lot about underwriting risks. We didn't talk about, it was mentioned once, but we didn't really talk about it. I think the greatest risk, I don't want to be a Cassandra, but, and it's not like I stay up at night thinking about this, but okay. What do I think the great risk is? China. The greatest risk to house prices and perhaps all asset prices is a change in China's behavior. So what's happened since 2000, since China's entry into the WTO? We've run a trade deficit with China. And what does that mean? That means China sends us goods and services, goods mostly, so we get goods. And what do they get? In exchange, they get our assets. That's how trade deficits work. That's really one reason that the interest rates have fallen, mortgage rates have fallen from numbers like 7% in 2000 to numbers like 4% today. Uh, but all asset prices have increased, all yields have fallen. And it could just be we're more patient than we used to be, but I sort of think it's China. And uh, Stein, again, Steiner's research about this. If this trade unwinds, interest rates are going to rise and asset prices are going to fall. And all these healthy balance sheets that we thought we had are all of a sudden going to look less healthy. I mean, if debt and equi assets fall by the same amount, maybe the equity position is preserved. But we seem to like stable asset prices, and that's a risk. And then I promised a random thought, so this is my last slide. Um, I've complained to Ed and Steve about this. Maybe that's why I'm an adjunct scholar. Uh, <laughs> think about all of the federal and state and local agencies we have that are housing related. It's mind numbing. There's HUD, FIFA, which used to be called OFEO, the CFPB, which didn't exist, uh, the Federal Reserve, all the banks plus the board, and then I added some dots. So think about there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people working there. Not one of them, I, this might be an overstatement, but to my knowledge, not one of them has proposed things that we heard here today that seem essential a risk index for mortgages. Have you seen any publications from any state agencies about a risk index for mortgages? How about a rethinking of mortgage lending for the poor? We haven't had any rethinking at all. The only thing we've had is a 50 basis point cut to a guarantee fee from FHA, which ultimately may not be a good thing given how loose lending standards are at the FHA. Do we have any talking about how lending standards should change based on intrinsic value? No, we have crazy QM rules that apparently don't apply to Fannie and Freddie, uh, <laughs> or FHA. We have none of that. And look at all the people we have working for the federal government. It, it, you know, my wife claims that our votes cancel each other out. But my votes <laughs> are from these kinds of thoughts. I, with a modest budget, and I, it's very modest. I paid for my own hotel room. With a modest budget, <laughs> Ed and Steve are doing the heavy lifting that our government should be doing. And I think that the work they're doing is important and impressive. And that's why I'm, I'm actually very happy to have the affiliation with AEI and to be a part of this conference. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Morris. Appreciate that. Um, Stan? Thanks, Stephen. It's uh, great to be here with you this morning. And uh, apologies for not being here yesterday. I was teaching until uh, 5 PM. But I have looked at the presentations that were presented yesterday. So I organized a few short thoughts. I don't know whether my presentation could be. Uh, put up. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so, just to kind of start us off, and this is probably along the lines of discussion you had yesterday. Um, wanted to start with reviewing some very short macro trends, which you are all familiar with, but I think conveyed a picture that ultimately the housing market today is in is on solid footing, in my opinion, and is uh, much recovered from where it was seven or eight years ago. Um, on the supply side, construction is is finally rebounding adding much uh, needed supply to housing. You could see per building permits um, here, actually months of supply in the housing market, which is uh, still very short, uh, very, still very small compared to historical averages. 
uh, you see that glut of housing that was accumulating before uh, and then during the crisis, um, and then kind of essentially a shrinking supply since then, a shrinking inventory, which puts a floor under house prices. Um, and then on the next slide, you see the, you see the, the building permits. You see that uh, for the longest time, we needed about, we have about a million and a half new households formed each year. Um, with population growth, with immigration, and so forth. Um, but uh, for a long time, for years on end, construction failed to keep pace uh, with that population growth. So we essentially had a structural deficit of construction, which more than offset the, the building uh, construction boom and glut we had um, peaking in 2005. And then I think, um, <clears throat> you know, a along with that, we have housing affordability, which is, um, here indexed, and, and you know, you've seen measures of, of, of affordability like this before. The idea is, does the median in household with the median income, is that median household able to afford the median house uh, with a standard 30-year fixed rate mortgage? And, and the higher this, this number, uh, this index, the more affordable housing is. So maybe contrary to widespread belief, housing is historically affordable today, I mean, over the last few years. So arguably, um, affordability has declined a little bit just in the last two years um, because, you know, as we know, house prices have risen uh, substantially in the last two years, while income has not. Uh, mortgage interest rates have fallen to compensate for, to some extent. Um, but you could easily see mortgage rates, if mortgage rates went up substantially from here, uh, house prices continued their current pace of growth and income continued to flatline. You could imagine housing affordability going down going forward. But right now, to this day, with mortgage rates where they are, housing is still affordable. Um, you know, new housing supply is coming on the market. There's a new generation Y of buyers that is slowly getting to that age where they're starting to uh, be interested in, in home ownership. Uh, I'm sure some of them will want to be a homeowner someday when they grow up. Uh, move out of the basement of their of their parents, and I think all of these are strong forces towards um, a, a kind of a continued recovery in the housing market. Uh, and then finally, and more, you know, equally importantly, um, we went through this massive deleveraging, uh, both the banking sector and um, and the household sector um, had an enormous credit binge in the boom. Uh, what I'm plotting here is uh, mortgage debt to housing wealth. So essentially. Uh, you know, the converse is that how much, what fraction of the house uh, does the typical homeowner own? And for the longest time, the answer was 60%. So 40% was mortgage, um, was basically debt, and 60% was equity. And then it, between 2006 and 2009, that went from a 60% equity, 40% debt ratio to a 40% equity, 60% debt ratio. Um, so basically, a massive increase in leverage, and then a very gradual and slow deleveraging that you see at, uh, since since 2009. So now we're pretty much, all, or at least almost, back to households owning 60% equity and 40% debt. Um, pretty much, we're at 65, 30. Uh, we're at 45, 55 right now. So basically, that's um, again, that's uh, providing a lot of cushion for at least in the aggregate for the housing market is putting households on more solid footing and is essentially, you know, restoring, if you like, a lot of skin in the game in the, in, in the housing market. So uh, kind of the last picture I have is on house prices and uh, you can see the recovery in house prices. This is a uh, price to rent ratios here. Uh, basically valuation ratios. You see, the, again, the enormous boom and, and bust, which you have seen before, and then the gradual recovery in house prices. I thought it was interesting to overlay on this commercial property price indices. And what you can see is that you know, they have very similar dynamics in the boom and the bust. Commercial real estate peaks a little bit later. It peaks a little bit higher, and it pretty much falls to the similar level as uh, house prices, but then you see this enormous divergence in the last uh, three, four years where commercial property is on fire, at least relative to house prices. That's so, property. What's that? That is not multifamily, that's all commercial property, office, retail, including, including multifamily. Yes, um, multifamily in fact looks, if anything, more more extreme than this because it's been one of the better performing sectors within commercial property. So, you know, it, at least relative to commercial property, the housing market is not particularly frothy. Of course, you could conclude the opposite, that commercial property valuations are ridiculous today, um, which coming from New York City, where office buildings are trading for less than 3% cap rates, it's kind of a reasonable opinion. Um, <laughs> um, but nevertheless, I think, long story short, I think, um, 
the, the housing market, in my view, is on is on solid footing today. So there's been a lot of debate about uh, lending standards, and 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 um, the American Enterprise Institute, alongside with other um, policy institutions um, like the Urban Institute, have been putting out all kinds of indices of lending standards. And I agree with Morris that this is very important work. Uh, we need to have good measures of of credit risk, just how tight our lending standards. What I wanted to do is to just kind of shed a couple, a little bit of light on that debate, uh, kind of drawing on my own research, um, because a lot of these measures are conflicting. According to some measures, there's actually, the, you know, the credit risk box has opened up substantially. According to other measures, credit is still very, very tight. Um, so there's often conflicting messages that we hear, and I think getting to the bottom of this is important. So why is it important? Well, because constraints, credit constraints do two things to households, right? So on the one hand, if you relax somebody's constraint, that's a good thing. If I can borrow more against my housing wealth, against my home equity, that's a good thing because I might get a shock. I might get, I might lose my job. I might get another income type shock. Um, you know, I can get a medical shock, right? That, you know, in this country, if you break a leg, that can essentially bankrupt you. If I can, if I can borrow against my house in those states of the world, that's a wonderful thing. That relaxes my constraint. That improves my ability to smooth my consumption over time. So we often forget about that. I think that is a very important, a very important benefit of relaxing constraints. Now, on the other hand, we have a big cost of relaxing constraints, which is essentially a negative externality from too much household debt, uh, and therefore default. You know, which is these these losses accrue to somebody. They cross typically to the financial sector, which is the levered financial sector. That's a crucial sector in our economy because it makes loans to small businesses, to to corporations, and so forth. And those are ultimately the create the creators of of jobs in the economy. So having too much excessive household debt is a is a terrible thing from that perspective. It induces financial fragility. So there's clearly a balancing act that we need to have between you know giving people that cushion to borrow against and at the same time not jeopardizing our, our financial um, our financial system so I think things like the well building home loan that was discussed yesterday uh, are, are, are great because they give more home equity with the homeowners which kind of increases that first layer of defense and makes ultimately the financial sector less less vulnerable um, so it hurts but, but of course you know that I mean I think Actually, one of the great things about the wealth building home loan is it's also trying to not make credit too tight in the sense that it's available to a lot of people because there there's essentially uh, no down payment early on. So, you know, I write here it hurts on A, but it helps with B, but it doesn't hurt too much on A. I think is the uh, is what I really want to say. Um, FHA and, GSC and the GSEs, as Morris just mentioned, have recently relaxed constraints. Um, and, and, and insurance premium and so forth uh, in an effort to, to expand mortgage credit that obviously helps on A and therefore cannot be prima facie evidence of a bad thing, but of course it hurts on B. It, it really makes, um, makes uh, you know, FHA, for example, more vulnerable and ultimately uh, the, the financial mortgage, uh, the, the mortgage financial system. So what I wanted to talk about um, in my last few minutes is about um, the GSCs. Um, because ultimately, that's at the core of these type of, of these type of questions, right? So this is based on a new research paper that um, I've worked on over the last few months, um, where we basically ask a counterfactual question: What would happen in a world without GSCs? So what if we were to phase out the GSCs? And opinions differ a lot on this question. Some people say, well, nothing much would happen. The CBO. Other people say, well, it would be a wonderful thing. Other people say it would be a terrible thing. Um, so what's what do we find? So what we find is that um, so the way we think about the GSCs is they're offering mortgage credit insurance, mortgage default insurance, to the financial sector at a subsidized rate. So what does the financial sector do when you offer them subsidized default insurance? They buy it. They buy a lot of it, right? Normally, when you offer something that's too cheap, people want it. People buy it. As a result, though, the problem is for for banks now a lot of their assets are guaranteed. Their, their asset profile, their asset risk profile is now a lot less risky because now they have this protection, this wrap from the government. But banks are levered institutions. They want a high ROE. They want a high return and high risk portfolio. So they respond by increasing their leverage, by making riskier mortgages, and by growing the size of their balance sheet in an effort to create, to, to have a higher risk return profile. So you have a moral hazard that leads to more financial fragility. In response to the subsidies, banks are levering up and they're going wild. 
that's what I'm describing what's happening inside the model here. Okay, so this increases financial fragility and, and, and hurts welfare, ultimately. And, in, and I think kind of the bigger picture here is that, and I think this is a point that, um, that Ed has made as well, is that in this ecosystem where the, the FHA and the GSEs are entrenched and they're exempt from all kinds of regulation and so forth, it's very hard for the private sector to materialize. Some people are, are, are mystified why private label securitization hasn't returned. I don't think it's a puzzle. There's, they, there's no fighting chance for the private sector to, to thrive in this, in this ecosystem. Um, so just a little bit more detail on what's happening in the model. So one of the interesting findings here is that when you phase out the GSCs in the model, it's actually good for everybody, which came as a bit, little bit of a surprise to us. So it's good for borrowers. That's maybe the most surprising thing. You would think for borrowers, when, when you phase out the GSCs, house prices will fall. And in fact, they do fall in the model. House prices would fall by about 6%. You would think that's bad news for borrowers. Uh, you would think mortgage interest rates will rise. And in fact, they do rise a little bit in the model, about 20 basis points, not a whole lot. Uh, and that's also bad news for borrowers. But the good news is we won't have this financial fragility in the system anymore. And so banks will be better capitalized. They'll be better able to help consumers smooth their consumption over time because they'll be, they'll be more solid. Bank, the banking sector will better help consumers, borrowers, smooth, smooth uh, across states of the world. And that's a good thing. Remember my thing about um, you know, relaxing constraints is a good thing for consumption smoothing. Well, that's happening in this model um, as well. So um, savers, of course, are also going to be better off because one of the things that happens in an economy that's safer is that interest rates go up. That's usually a good sign for interest rates to go up. When the real interest rate goes up, it means that the economy as a whole is there's less precautionary savings people have to do because the world is not so, such a scary place. When you, when you don't have to save f uh, again, uh, to hedge against risk, then interest rates go up. When interest rates go up, that's a good thing for savers, right? So savers benefit, and then ultimately banks benefit. And the fact that banks benefit, again, is, you know, if the banking industry wants us to believe that what will happen is that they actually, the banking industry, to my great surprise, is a great fan of the GSEs, a great fan, maybe their biggest fan, even more than the, than the, house, than the consumer advocates. Um, so it's like this unholy alliance of consumer advocates and the banking system for preserving the GSEs. And it's kind of, and, it, and it's, it's misguided. And the reason it's misguided is because their logic is that ultimately this is good for business, these GSEs, and ultimately it's going to help their ROE. In fact, um, and so they, their argument is always, well, you know, otherwise we would have to hold a lot more equity if, if we had to bear all that credit risk ourselves. Well, guess what? It turns out that that's just false. You know, their ROE would actually not necessarily fall. They would have more equity, but they'd be better off for it. They make more money doing it because they would be earning higher spreads on, 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 on their, um, on their um, mortgage uh, lending versus their cost of deposits. So, you know, you kind of need a model to think through all of these things, which is what we're trying to provide in this paper. Um, as an aside, if you had renters, uh, this is something that uh, Morris um, has mentioned as well. If you subsidize something, then things, it becomes expensive. So house prices are too high in, 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 the, in this world. Price to rent ratios are too high. So if you were to phase out the GSEs, yes, prices would fall. But that would be good news for potential buyers. It would be good news for first-time home buyers. Right? So that's an effect we don't even have in the model, which would further uh, tend to amplify the positive effects of phasing out the GSEs. So the last thing I, what we do in the paper is we evaluate this Johnson Crapo proposal. I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with it, probably a, a fair number, but it's essentially uh, wants the private sector to bear the bulk of the losses in the in mortgage credit losses. And then in a really catastrophic event, uh, when losses are gigantic, more than 10%, uh, then the government would come to, would, would step in. So we evaluate this proposal in the context of our model. We find it to be a good proposal in the sense that uh, it generates about the same welfare benefits of a full phase out. So before I was discussing a full phase out, uh, this is an alternative to a full phase out and it generates the same welfare benefits. Uh, again, the intuition is that it's not bad for the government to provide a little bit of a floor under the banking system in really, really, really adverse states of the world. If those states are adverse enough, then moral hazard is not an issue anymore because the banking sector bears 99% of the losses anyways. So we're talking about that 1% um, probability of a catastrophic uh, crash that would wipe out the banking system. Um, so that's, that's, um, that turns out to be a good thing. Now, there's other reasons to be skeptical about this, which is it kind of recreates something that looks a lot like Fannie and Freddie private companies with 
shareholders' equity as a first line of defense and the government as a catastrophic insurer. Sounds kind of familiar, right? So, um, so I think you know, there's again reality and the model. Uh, we have to we have to try to square them away. At the very least, it would require a very reliable bank resolution regime. Uh, otherwise, we get the same type of two systemic to fail uh, entities in the banking sector that used to be uh, Fannie and Freddie. So to conclude, um, I think with housing markets on solid footing, now is the perfect time for housing finance reform. Unfortunately, things in Washington, D.C. are stuck. Uh, and I don't expect, I mean, you probably know this better than I, but I don't expect any action in Congress anytime soon on this. Um, I think th the way to go is to raise the cost of the government default insurance, slowly but surely. Um, the GSEs have already started doing this. The G fee went from 20 basis points to 55 basis points. It probably needs to continue rising to at least 150 basis points for us to realistically crowd, crowd in the private sector. And by the way, a lot of people would argue, that's my last point, that the GSEs provide this great liquidity benefit through the TBA market and so forth. You don't, you don't need to get rid of that market in order to get rid of the subsidy to default insurance. right? So it could be as simple as, you know, change the name of the GSEs, make it a government entity which is very small, nimble footprint, and have this credit risk transfer that is currently taking place through the stacker and the CAS deals, have that be 100% of the, of, the, of the portfolio. Okay, so at this point, essentially, you have implemented uh, a catastrophic risk insurance, um, which is essentially the same as, as, as what the Johnson Crapo um, Act envisions. I'll stop there, there, and then maybe later we could talk about China. <laughs> Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, Susan? Yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me here and for convening this fourth uh, annual uh, uh, symposium on housing risk. Uh, how do we get to this? Slide? Just keep, keep, keep clicking, going. keep clicking forward. Yep, yep, you got it, good. Um, I think I'll start with just making some comments, uh, brief comments on uh, the two presenters uh, prior to me. I think I fall somewhere in between uh, the two on prognostication of pessimism versus optimism. I do agree with Sin that the housing market is today on solid footing, uh, but I do agree with Morris that there are real risks uh, ahead. Uh, and I agree with Morris that um, asset prices housing and uh, real estate asset prices are high, that cap rates, price to rent ratios are high. Uh, not so much other assets, uh, which in fact have uh, fallen in prices with the decline, with the slowing in growth in China. Uh, so my uh, perception of the risk is, and China's prices also, land prices, have stabilized and come down and are now uh, slightly moving up. So my, my perception of the risk, we can talk about China, we seem to all want to, and I think that's right, because it's the biggest risk factor out there later. But my perception of the risk, where the risk is coming from, is actually different than Mars's, And it is, from my perspective, coming from a potential secular stagnation, slow growth, capital coming from developing countries into the US, uh, and the potential for an interest rate sharp rise with a worldwide recession and increase in risk. So I think what's interesting about this is that there's room for reasonable people to disagree. And uh, therefore, we need scenarios of different potential risk out there and for the housing sector to which households are most exposed and also the banking sector is most exposed, we need to know the so what. And what we don't have, but we're working on it, and many of the people in this room are working, and AEI has taken a prominent position on this, is risk indicators, a risk scorecard, if you would, for the housing finance sector. I think we all agree on the importance of that. Uh, so where are we on that? So that's what my, my comments today are going to address, and then I'll come back to the risks of the future, perhaps, in our discussion. Uh, so this is uh, an early morning session. It's a, a new day, and um, my perspective, given yesterday's proceedings, which uh, unfortunately I could not be at either, but I also looked and was able to follow, a really extraordinary work is being done. So I am rather optimistic, actually, on the potential for 
uh, more insight and ongoing information being provided about this critical sector for the U.S. and global economy. However, I am not, it's not because, I'm, I'm not uh, optimistic and hopeful because this is an unimportant or the problem is going away. Quite the contrary. The problem of the fragility, potential fr fragility of housing finance sector is global and it's across nations and over history, but, but more than that, it has gotten far worse over time. And the reason for this problem, it's not accidental that it's gotten worse over time. And the reason, and it's not accidental, the problems in the housing sector, the reason is that real estate has an intrinsic problem, which is the incompleteness of the real estate sector. I understand Ed DeMarco made comments yesterday about the importance of some way to trade real estate risk, and I could not agree more with that comment. Because the problem is that optimists do set real estate prices because of the lack of uh, of mechanisms to easily short real estate. I've worked with uh, Richard Herring on this, uh, real estate booms and banking busts. And I want to just point out here that it's not just a securitization system that leads to booms and busts, but the simultaneous world through much of the globe uh, real estate boom in 2007 was worse actually in many European countries, Ireland, Iceland, the UK, Spain, and that was bank driven. And the problem is that real estate prices are then ratified and propagated through a financial accelerator again, Herring and, and I have written about this, that implicates the housing finance system, particularly through appraisals that are based on optimist set market prices. And I am so grateful for the work being done on AEI, at AEI on this and the continued work, and I understand we'll hear more about that later today. So credit bubbles propagate asset bubbles and do so in this critical sector and for both the finance sector banking sector bringing it to its knees, and for the household sector, leading to over-pledging of collateral, which means that the real sector is implicated because after the crisis, you can't borrow, and therefore the real economy, real purchases are impacted. And instead of having credit smoothing, as Stin mentioned, instead of having credit smoothing because of the availability of housing finance, you in fact have endogenous uh, uh, cycles. So um, how do we deal with this? Uh, what's the solution? And I am going to uh, actually skip ahead to this one and come back to the previous slide. Uh, we, are, we are brought to our knees because of the lack of information. We can, and many people did, in fact, I, I guess I'll go back for a moment, did note this price to rent huge uh, expansion in the ratio of price to rent, which I show uh, in one of these graphs, one of these lines. But what they, what people did not know, what was unknown, was the increase in mortgage, risky mortgage product, and the increase in overall debt. So what did we not know? We didn't know the uh, mortgage terms. We didn't know mortgage rates. We didn't know uh, the characteristics of the mortgages. Uh, we didn't know counterparty risk. Uh, and particularly, if you looked at loan, this is what this uh, graph on the right shows, if you looked at uh, loan-to-value ratios, and many people were tracking this, the Fed was tracking this uh, in this period, uh, it looked actually rather benign. It looked flat. But if you looked at combined loan-to-value ratios, which data was not available, that is, if you added second liens, two first liens, then you would have seen a tremendous run-up. The problem is that the second lien data is not available at the time. This is after the fact. And this is second liens at origination, by the way, was not available at the time. Uh, again, the leverage then, the over-leverage, is the key to potential default risk, which is, again, why, uh, as others have said, the uh, wealth-building home loan mortgage is so important because this overpledging is going to lead to anti-smoothing in terms of consumption uh, going forward as opposed to the um, benefits of access to financing. So in a paper that has just come out with my colleague Adam Levitin uh, in uh, Vanderbilt Law Review, we talk about why we cannot track second liens 
and uh, uh, why, in fact, first lien holders in housing and real estate, unlike any other asset, have no say on second liens. And that's uh, in, in, in the law, actually, which would have to be changed to make a difference on this. So this, uh, of course, then the last uh, in, in intrinsic problem is the lack of ability to short sell. So we didn't know all of this, but the good news is that we are learning more, which I'll come back to in a moment. But if we had, so what, what's, what we didn't know did in fact hurt us. If we had known what the characteristics of mortgages were, how risky, and uh, the increase in the CLTV, we would have been able to track the price to rent ratio. This is a paper that I did with uh, Andre Pavlov, uh, which points to the um, very Im impressive predictive ability of uh, the mortgage uh, product mix uh, uh, ratio uh, to overall lending, uh, how it predicts the um, uh, price to rent ratio. So if we had known the information, arguably there we could have done more. And in fact, the key piece of information, a key piece of information that we would have had to know and that was shrouded was not just the supply, the mortgage supply, but the price at which it was being uh, supplied. So the price of risk uh, in the run-up to the crisis actually decreased. So the price of uh, mortgage-backed securities, both in the commercial sector and on the residential sector. Uh, we have uh, shown this in work, uh, myself with Adam Levitan, for both sectors uh, and also for mortgage-backed securities. The price relative to uh, AAA uh, credit, the price relative to treasuries, declined. The interest rate compressed, so the risk premium for credit decreased. So um, in a work that I've done with Andre Pavlov, this was coming out of the Asian financial crisis. We were working on this as we were getting into the subprime crisis. We, uh, the, the paper uh, uh, was written, it was being written at that point. We look back at 40, this is just a few of them, uh, 40 uh, peak to trough crises. And we looked at the compression of the credit risk premium prior to the uh, peak and its correlation to price rise increases relative to rents. And we found that, uh, as you would expect, where credit risk was underpriced and that was correlated to price to rent increases, that predicted since there were fundamental factors as the underpricing of risk, which would then shift at the moment of crisis to correctly reprice risk uh, would, uh, would then destabilize the overall economy. So this ex ante, this pavlov walker it's not quite Black-Scholes, but we're trying. Um, the, um, this pavlov walker indicator ex ante predicts uh, the depth of the crisis at uh, once, a, um, a, 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 once the downturn be begins. So we need to know a lot. And the good news is we are, in fact, uh, learning more. So what do we know now that we didn't know? Uh, and, and this is um, really very hopeful. And a lot of people in this room at AEI and elsewhere are working to provide more information about the market. Risk indicators are being developed. Uh, this is uh, uh, extraordinarily important, linking this to the vulnerability of financial institutions is work in progress, hasn't been done, but is, it is a work in progress. It is, and we could talk more about the details of work that's underway. The bad news about information is that we still don't have uh, the second lien issue uh, under, under control in terms of reporting to first lien holders or easily tracking second liens. But there's work that's being done on that as well. Uh, uh, the new Humda data, I understand, will include second liens. This is extremely important that it does, at least to inform uh, what the regulators and market risk takers what's happening in the overall market. And that's perhaps, to my mind, the most hopeful uh, outcome of, of the change, and that is that we do have new instruments to trade real estate price risk. We do have uh, credit-linked notes, as uh, Stin mentioned. We have Stacker. We have CAS. 
So we have the ability for the private sector to use the information that we are developing uh, to price risk in the market as it develops. But of course, that isn't sufficient. We do need to have uh, full information. We are, uh, the price, the credit risk, credit linked notes are being used right now to price uh, GSE risk and the uh, portfolio information is being revealed, uh, uh, the GSEs, that's a good move. That was pushed and, and prior to the crisis, we didn't have that, shockingly, uh, but now that is available. Uh, so are we all there? Is there no problem? Is there, um, are we getting to a uh, Johnson Crapo kind of outcome uh, that uh, Stin uh, mentioned, essentially, that will work? So um, it, there seems to be a consensus that catastrophic insurance uh, is important in any of these solutions, any of these uh, potential solutions to uh, a housing finance system reform for the long run. And as Jin mentioned, as soon as you do that, you have moral hazard. As soon as you do that, you have the taxpayer and the government on the hook. So it's, it's in itself not a solution because adverse events will happen and they're more likely to happen with the knowledge of catastrophic insurance. And at that point, there will be a withdrawal, of course, of the funding through credit-linked notes. So I do think it's important, couldn't be more important than to have credit risk transfer and have credit-linked notes to price risk and also to have data behind it to inform on the pricing of risk. But in the end of the day, we do need to have private capital at risk. So we need to have capitalization for institutions for the long run. And here I note the work uh, that was discussed here by uh, Ted Durant yesterday uh, and the counter-cyclical capital for mortgage insurance, uh, which I think is extraordinarily important, but not, of course, just for the private mortgage insurance sector. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Susan. So um, I had uh, one comment on Morris's presentation, then a question for Stin, Stin and um, Susan. And then I'll give the three panelists a chance to comment on each other's presentations if they would like to, and then we'll open up for Q&A. So one of the points that Morris made on his final slide, which I completely agree with, is that it is surprising that none of the housing agencies um, including the Fed, I think it's most surprising for the Fed, uh, have really come out with measures of housing and mortgage risk, particularly for the Fed. Um, so I just wanted to indicate that we actually did invite several Fed economists to come and speak today, and they wanted to come to talk specifically about mortgage risk measurement at the Fed. But unfortunately, because of the Fed's bizarre blackout rules surrounding FOMC meetings, which not only precede the meeting, but continue throughout the entire week of the meeting, they couldn't come. So <laughs> next year, uh, we have a date for this conference that is outside of the Fed's blackout <laughs> period for October. And I'm confident they will be here and we'll have a more robust discussion of what's actually happening at least to the Fed in terms of the measurement of the risk. So I know that they're aware of the mortgage risk index. In fact, they do their own mortgage risk index that they present to the board that's very similar to our methodology. In fact, they do it using proprietary data on loan applications. So they, they actually have information that predates ours that they use internally. Whether it has any effect on the policy discussions or decisions, that's a different story. Um, then a question for um, Sten. Um, you, you indicated that the GSE guarantee fees are too low relative to the credit risk. Um, and we know from the uh, guarantee fee report that uh, FHFA put out um, earlier this year that that subsidy is not uniform across loan types. It's really focused on lower credit quality loans, those that have FICOs below 660 and on 30-year loans. Um, unfortunately, the report shows bars that indicate directionally what um, this subsidy is, but there are no numbers on the axis. <laughs> so I was wondering in your work whether you had gotten down to that level of granularity to try to estimate the subsidies. So um, yeah, the short answer is no, but what we do have, in the sense that um, we have no heterogeneity across borrowers in our model, however, we can calculate the average subsidy 
Mm-hmm. And what we find is that, so maybe not surprisingly, but I guess we didn't understand this when we first started this project, um, the extent of the subsidy depends on the on the world you live in. If you live in a world where the actual GFE is 20 basis points, then that's a very fragile world where there will be a lot of mortgage defaults and a lot of mortgage foreclosures. And therefore, the actuarially fair GFE will be much higher. So in that world, it turns out the actuarially fair GFE is 75 basis points. So the subsidy is 55 basis points. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's a pretty precise number for what the extent of the subsidy is, and I think it's massive. Now, if you transitioned to a safe world where, let's say, the let's say the GSEs charge 200 basis points for, for for the subsidy, then nobody would want to buy it anymore. In that world, the actuarially fair GFE, if there's such a thing, right, would actually be much lower because it's a much safer world. Mm-hmm. So it depends on what world you live in, but the subsidy is about 50 basis points. Okay, good, thanks. Um, and, and Susan, um, you talked a little bit about the market um, mechanisms now for uh, pricing and trading credit risk. I was wondering, are you at all optimistic about the development and popularization of either financial contracts or, um, or actual uh, contracts that individuals can buy to hedge their own idiosyncratic house price risk, which is massive. And we talked yesterday a lot about how much variability there is in the path for house prices, not only at the uh, local level, but at the individual house level. Yeah, that's the Achilles heel. The idiosyncratic risk is right. the problem. And that appears to me why you know, the Case-Shiller index never took off because it's, it is the idiosyncratic risk, which is important for individual homeowners. Mm-hmm. However, so I'm no, I, in short, am not optimistic, but if I, if I may, um, I don't think that's critically important. What I think is critically important is that there's market-wide, maybe region as well, but market-wide ability to trade because, uh, against price risk. Um, and to pri- not only to trade, but to price it, so that we have price discovery of what the of what is the perce- what is the market uh, vote on what the risk is, and the reason that's important is uh, coming out of what Morris was saying is the kind of event that we had in two thousand seven is is not only specific regions; it's nationwide because there's a national mortgage change, and that's what we need to know. That's the information that's going to pull down the financial sector. And for individual homeowners, going back to work that's done out of Wharton, Tot Sinai, and others, actually owning is a hedge against renting. So that's another reason why the case shiller uh, doesn't take off, because you actually, when you own, you're already engaging in buying insurance. You're hedging against rent increases by being on both sides of your renting to yourself. So there may not be a great, as long as you're in there for the long run, Mm -hmm. there may not be a great demand from the individual homeowners. What we need to do is protect the individual homeowners against the huge volatility that occurs when price becomes out of line with fundamentals. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Any comments and thoughts that the panel would like to offer at this point? Sure. I wanted to ask Susan whether she thought that uh, ABX or CMBX would not be, they've been around since 2006, what are those instruments? What's wrong with those instruments? No. So th- I've, I've looked at that with, with some of my colleagues, and the problem is they didn't predict it, nor even did REITs. Mm-hmm. And you would think, because as you, as you showed, the commercial, and, and we have a paper on this as well, the commercial real estate prices tracked with a slight lag uh, uh, housing prices too. So there's a bubble in commercial as well. And when REITs were in fact brought, the second generation of REITs were brought into into play in the 1990s after the crisis of, we thought at the time was a big crisis of 1990, and the new REITs would solve the problem. We would have liquid real estate and we'd be able to price it. And in fact, I think the REITs have been extremely helpful both in regional pricing and also in bringing capital back out from Wall Street, which is why the commercial market has recovered so much faster, very important. But in any case, what it didn't do is it didn't signal the 2007 overpricing. And the reason for that was the continuous increase in effort of issuing underpriced credit coming from AIG, coming from CDS. So in the face of the increased supply of underpriced mortgage credit, there was uh, 
correctly, in some sense, priced asset pricing because the cost of credit was so low uh, for, the, uh, for, for, the, for the real estate asset. These were actually correctly priced. So the asset market was not mispriced. It was the debt market that was mispriced. So we need a combination of debt market instruments, which is why I like the credit link notes, because they're not just the asset side. They're, the, they're reflecting default risk. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we need better information on. Uh, Morris? Yeah, just to mention one thing. I, you know, I never, I never gave an outlook about the U.S. housing market. There's just better people that are better equipped to do that. I just, what I was trying to point out were sort of modal risks that I think about. So just to get another, I actually think Canada is much more exposed to China than we are, but we're exposed to Canada. So the, um, and so that means we're exposed. The, um, I guess we're going to see a presentation later about cap rates or implied cap rates in the housing sector in Vancouver and Toronto. Is that right? Is a Canada person going to talk about that? I mean, what's going on in Canada is just shocking. And I think you could say that's all China. And there's, you know, Vancouver is pleasant, but it's like, <laughs> it's fine. Toronto's not New York. And if you ask Canadians, Canadians I know that will admit in privately, Canada equals 0 0.8 times the U.S. and everything. So, you know, um, you know, <laughs> Canada, Canada also only has six banks, so or five banks. So they're really, really exposed to a shock from China. And if there's a financial crisis in Canada, there, something bad will happen in the U.S. too. I said my piece on that. Yeah, so can I say something about China as well? I think. Uh, absolutely. Then we'll yeah. go to Q&A. Great. Um, so I'm working on a paper right now which thinks about um, the effect of these Chinese purchases of U.S. treasuries. I mean... Foreign official institutions are holding three quarters of U.S. Treasury debt. It's really a shocking number. Um, it's, the, it's the Chinese Central Bank, the Korean Central Bank, and the Japanese Central Bank. The three, the three of them combined, 61% to be precise. Um, and so in my research, what I'm trying to answer is the counterfactual. What would happen if... And so that's about 30% of U.S. GDP right now, these foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries, 30% of, of GDP. What I'm trying to answer is the counterfactual. What would happen if there was this great unwind where it went from 30% of GDP, these foreign holdings, to 15% of GDP, to half, which would be the historical average. And, and the answer is interest rates would go up by 250 basis points in this country. Um, and again, you know, that's, that's a model estimate. You know, take that with a grain of salt. But interest rates would go up dramatically. And the reason is that these guys are very price inelastic buyers of U.S. Treasury debt. As Morris was saying, they're just in the, in the process of doing business with the U.S. They're accumulating all these, um, you know, basically this huge current account surplus with us. And they are not interested in trying to make a return on that money. They want that money to be in a safe asset, in a safe haven asset, which is U.S. Treasuries. And so they basically want to buy U.S. Treasuries regardless of the interest rate that we're paying them. Right, which is why interest rates have been so low. I mean, we've we've, we've had the reverse of this. We had from 15% to 30% foreign holdings that has put enormous downward pressure on the real interest rate in this country, enormous. And I think this could easily re reverse. And I think you know, you know, whether the Fed raises interest rates by 25 basis points is kind of pales in comparison to to that story. I think it's a crucial story for the next, maybe not for the next one year, but for the next. Uh, five to ten years, as China's GDP starts to slow down in the in the in the course of business, they're not going to be reinvesting a lot of that money in treasuries anymore, and so you know somebody else is going to have to hold these treasuries. You know, U.S. agents with, which don't have such price inelastic demand for these treasuries, and interest rates will have to rise. So very quickly, I absolutely agree. We are totally exposed to China, and the work I'm doing with Pedro Guete, uh, uh, the China is exposed to its own land value and real estate far more than we are, both for not uh, less so in the financial sector, but definitely, of course, in the household sector. But the reason they're exposed is because their much of their investment comes from local. Uh, metro and city city reinvestment, and that depends on the ability to sell uh, land and land prices, and that's where the volatility is coming. We are exposed to China, yes, through Canada, yes, through developing countries. We're exposed through a potential uh, recession, and that recession would increase risk, and interest rates would go up at the same time. So this is our exposure, and it is something I am absolutely worried about. Uh, I don't see it as uh, I'm not predicting it, but it certainly is a risk. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll go to questions from the floor. I think 
Ed had his hand up first, then Penny. So um, I think a number of comments about uh, catastrophic risk in the housing need for a government guarantee. Uh, Alex Pollock, I mentioned this a couple times yesterday, so I'll have to get it in one more time today. Uh, there's no, nothing new in, housing, in finance. So when Fannie Mae was taken out of uh, HUD in 1968, it had about a 10% capital requirement, uh, give or take. Um, interestingly, it had no credit risk at that point because it only invested in FHA loans and a little bit of credit risk on VA, but it didn't have a conventional program. It did have some interest rate risk. Um, and when it did its business, uh, its servicing system, it had regular and special. Regular was recourse to the lender, the originator. So that was the norm. Special was the non-recourse. Uh, Freddie Mac, when it started its uh, PC, PC stood for participation certificate. It was, um, there was an interest by the lender in the certificate. They kept part of it and uh, were on the risk. Uh, so my question is, we had a system like that. Uh, it didn't work. Why do you think, I mean, it, it blew up. I mean, eventually, the, all of those things that said we're going to have all these protections in capital, Fannie Mae's mm -hmm. capital requirement went from 10 percent to 0.2, whatever it is, like 0.4, whatever it was, 0.45 on the credit side, two and a half on the on the uh, in, in, uh, portfolio side, and Freddie Mac, you know, the same thing. And everybody abandoned the participation and recourse. So why do you think this? So having a, a government guarantee that's, you know, the catastrophic guarantee against the 10 percent capital by the private sector is going to work when it didn't work last time. Well, what is that going to, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but I think you've answered your own question. There was capital, and then the capital deteriorated, and, and so I think that's the, the point. Political. Through the political pressures, absolutely. Why wouldn't that happen again, is my question. Oh, political pressures. I don't doubt it. The way it works. I, I, don't, I don't doubt it, and, and I think that's in, why, uh, Absolutely, there will be political pressure, and that's why there needs to be. So, so my concern is that basically right now we have a nationalized system, and uh, I, th I absolutely think we need to move away from the nationalized system and have private capital with private corporations. I think that at risk, and it doesn't solve the problem entirely because as much as we might say that we will not have catastrophic insurance, in the end, if we're going to have Great Depression 2.0, there will be a step in. So, but we need to have as, we, we need to do two things. We need to have as much capital as is, uh, uh, as the banking sector has, as Basel has, I mean, that's, that's clear. Secondly, we must be aware of the procyclical deterioration in that capital. And that's where information has been absent in the past. I mean, I'm sympathetic to your to your line of reasoning. Um, I guess my statement was just in a world where you can have 10% capital stay, 10% capital. Um, I think it's very similar to, I mean, deposit insurance. For 10 years, from 1996 to 2007, not a single bank paid any deposit insurance because the coffers of the FDIC were full and the bank started to lobby against these fees. They're like, why, would, why do we need to continue to pay in into this? You know, we've never had a banking crisis, and guess what? You know, in 2008, the FDIC went basically broke. Um, so that's, a, that's what happens. Political pressure mounts as long as the crisis doesn't realize, and then when it realizes, people realize that the fee was too low. So, so let me ask a question for the one. How many bank failures do you think there were in 2004 and 2005? Bank, bank failures were there, bailouts, in 2004 and 2005. Of course, you would know. Zero. And at that was the point where everyone said, well, there's no risk here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, excess capital because yeah. they didn't need it. In mm -hmm. 2006 was when it happened. <laughs> Penny? Hi, thank you. Um, my question is around uh, what you think about the impacts to private capital entering the market of everything that's been going on in the mortgage industry today around risk that has nothing to do with default risk, interest rate risk, credit risk, but has to do with compliance risk. And, and I'm, I'm speaking of QM, QRM, the ACOA changes, UDAP, in particular the TILA RESP integrated disclosure where the, some of that compliance risk actually follows through to the investor. Do you think any of that is having the chilling effect on private capital entering 
versus some of the other risk you're talking about? I'll speak to this a little bit. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of two publicly traded companies, and uh, we talk about Sarbanes-Oxley all the time and compliance all the time. And um, my understanding is that you know you can't just be a mortgage servicer; you have to be approved by Fannie and Freddie, and and that mortgage servicers can sometimes pay big fees from the CFPB for things they didn't do, or did they thought they were following the law? They were following the law, but but CFPB find them anyway. Um, ultimately, I think compliance risks driving up. It's forcing consolidation and it's driving up prices, neither of which I think are particularly good. And I, I would add it's probably driving a lot of the activity towards the shadow banking system. I think that's one of the other big trends today is that the, the, the formal regulated banking system is shrinking relative to the rest of the financial system. So now we're going to lose a grip on, you know, to the extent that regulation has positive benefits. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. No, exactly. That's exactly right. Morning. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. I think when we talk about economic analysis, we talk about supply and demand. We talk about the price or housing is depend on who want to buy it. But the problem is the data itself or accounting and all the government implementation of the law are all really not reliable and uh, lack of competency, uh, also arbitrary and irrational. So I just wonder if we go this direction, let's say for instance, the housing is based on, the, in one way it's lobbied by developer and all developers team, which including the lobbyists and lawyers. They lobby the town or the cities to supply the grants or funding, and then they don't implement the real law, they protect the consumers or homeowners. So is there any study that would say, we have to really focus on the rational behavior, and let's say the consumer, they will be protected, and government is really represent the people, rather than the other around. So we are analyze the data all in a, very artificial manner. I'll take a small stab at that one. It's tough. Uh, you know, there's uh, the economists at the Federal Reserve were outstanding. Uh, and the Federal Reserve Board itself, it, it's actually pained me a little bit to watch their Republican debate last night um, when the question about the Federal Reserve came up, having worked naturally leaning towards the Republican Party and then seeing in the attack at the Fed where I used to work, I, that sort of pained me. I wish that would stop because um, the people at the Federal Reserve have uh, really nothing but the public's interest in mind. That's the economist there. I can't speak to every single person, but everyone that I worked with, that was true. But I will, I will share one funny uh, anecdote with you, uh, which I hope Steve doesn't mind that I share. The <laughs> it used to be that the dumber economists were put on the house price forecast. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I say that uh, tongue in cheek, the uh, because it used to be the easiest thing to forecast. Oh, sure. You'd write down four and then you'd move on, and uh, <laughs> so I think let's say the lack of data and lack of accounting resulted from the fact that um, in certain geographic regions housing did sort of interesting things, but in terms of system wide booms and busts, they weren't viewed as that important. And I think it's only recently that we've relearned the lessons from the 30s uh, of how important it is to track this for the public welfare. Um, I, I guess the only thing I would add to your question is that accurate data and transparency and objective analysis of those data are, of course, critical. I mean, I think that's a lot of what this conference is trying to do, is to try to uh, push forward that whole um, endeavor. And I think we have made a lot of progress. There's certainly a lot more information that's reliable 
about what's happening in mortgage and housing markets today than there was before the financial crisis. So we have a long way to go, but I think we're heading in the right direction. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, first, a comment. As a banker, I can't tell you compliance risk, whether it's uh, TRID, QM, QRM, Basel III uh, is having an impact. Uh, it, it's making us think twice uh, just the uh, time it takes to get approved to become a servicer uh, to keep our own customers' loans uh, is, is ridiculous. But uh, just the comment aside, a two-part question. Um, in bringing private capital back into the market, do you think it's time we revisit the Homeowners Protection Act of 1999 to look at perhaps expanding private mortgage insurance coverage, especially on loans greater than 15 years, to uh, a loan to value that is below, that is lower than 80 percent, maybe 70, 75, uh, 60 percent even. And then the second question is, the Chicago Tribune just reported on September 30th that uh, in the first six months of the year, over 650,000 new home equity lines of credit, totaling 70 billion, were extended to borrowers. Um, as yesterday, as we heard from uh, Director DeMarco and that about really asymmetrical information in the marketplace, what outside of Humda, what better ways are there uh, to go ahead and try to gather that extra information, such as on second liens and that, so that we have a better idea of the leveraging of the uh, U.S. household? Could it be call reports, per perhaps, that are done quarterly? I can do the second. Uh, so let me just let me address the second. Maybe someone else will address the first. Uh, the uh, Humda data will not be able to do this uh, until January 20, uh, 2016. It's even later than that, actually. 18 is my understanding. Uh, and uh, but but there is another data set, which is the National Mortgage Database, uh, that is, um, uh, I believe, actually a, a prototype is in place right now. And that data will also be, it's a, a sample of one in 20 of all mortgages. And they, too, using private databases, which are currently available, uh, will be putting together uh, uh, an index, including first and second liens. So um, it's not yet publicly available. It's a prototype. But my understanding is that there will be, at some point, a publicly available national mortgage database. Uh, that's probably a few years down the line. Uh, in the meantime, we can uh, uh, the day, FHFA is working on on these data. Perhaps someone else in the room knows more about where that is. Um, Susan, can I ask you a question about the second lien data that you used in your study? Yes. Where did that come from? Uh, that came from Intex, which is a private data source, uh, and that data. Um, uh, was um, supplied to uh, Andy Davidson's firm, mm -hmm. and they paid for it, of course, uh, very expensive data, uh, but Andy Davidson's firm is in the business, so, that, so it made sense for them to purchase the data uh, and, uh, and collect it, uh, but it's not publicly available. So we used it uh, for our research paper, we're working with that firm, we, were, we did get access to it. But there's also a lag, uh, a substantial lag, and it was very expensive. Okay. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, the data are available right now, if, but it's expensive, and it, there are all sorts of um, uh, uh, gaps in the data. The matches that you put together are only two-thirds correct, so there are all sorts of problems right. in putting it together. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So one comment is um, that I would make about the work we're doing here on the National Mortgage Risk Index. Um, right now, it is limited to first liens and home purchase loans, but we have projects uh, that will be pursuing shortly to expand that coverage, and that would include second liens as well. Where will, sure. May I ask, where will you get the second lien data? Well, I mean, our initial source is going to be CoreLogic. Yep, that's, so. that's right. Yeah. John. Uh, this is a follow-up question to Susan. On that national mortgage database, mortgage database wouldn't the big missing component be the market value of the property? Yes. So how can you measure that over leveraging if you don't know what the well property is? Well said. And I just have a paper that I just finished. I'm about to um, put onto SSRN just on that issue. So my understanding, but this is all in play, is that there will link back through Humda to property value. 
Uh, but, but the matches are not accurate. It's only two out of three. We do not have a national, as everyone must, you must know, we do not have a national property indicator. You, so there's no, date, rather, identifier. So there's no easy link. That said, uh, it seems to me that if we do have the based appraised value of the property, which I believe Humda will have, and if that is linked to the NMDB database for 1 in 20, then it's possible. I'm ju we're just beginning to think this through. It will be possible to create a region-wide aggregation using indexes, Zillow, Trulio, et cetera, um, indexes of how prices have increased over time relative to the appraised value. This is a work in progress, and I'm not suggesting it will be easy to get there, and the folks who are actually doing this, and I'm attempting to do it to some degree too, know the challenges ahead. But it isn't impossible. It actually can be done even without a property identifier that we're, ideally it would be terrific to have that going forward, but I think we can do a workaround. So, uh one thought related to this. Is my mic on? You have the green light. Yeah. Okay, one thought related to this. So something, you know, the federal government assigns each of us a social security number, and we none of us are totally comfortable with that, but it does provide researchers a way to link people across time and place. I sort of think something the federal government should do is assign every parcel its own number. And then we can finally, okay, you may not like that, but if we believe that uh, fundamentally accurate data is key to sound policy, then this will finally provide us a way to link mortgages with properties. So I think the questioner is going in that direction. The Office of Financial Research uh, has put together a uh, white paper on whether that's possible and what are the barriers to doing so. It might be um, useful for, if anyone would like access to that, I can provide it. Hmm. Thanks. Is it? What's the bottom line on that? Is it feasible? Daunting. Okay. Tom? Yeah. Uh, thank you and good morning. My question is for Stan, and it has to do with your conclusion that housing is very affordable. And uh, in, in your presentation, you cite the NAR's index, affordability index. Is the methodology in, the, in that index solid enough to draw that conclusion? And aren't they treating Lincoln, Nebraska, and Los Angeles as an example, or Seattle, uh, with the same weighting in that index? So, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how the different regions are being weighted. I think the idea of comparing a median house price with a median income and a standard mortgage rate is, 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 is fine enough. I mean, I would argue as long as, um, you know, presumably that index should be reported at the regional level, right? So then we could have a finer, uh, and in fact, there is, there is data on this, on what housing affordability by state looks like, for example. Uh, the Urban Institute, for example, compiles, compiles uh, metrics for every state on exactly what that housing affordability number looks like. And it does vary dramatically across regions, as you might imagine. San Francisco, I mean, housing in San Francisco is not affordable, for example. Um, so, our, you know, obviously, you know, regional variation is important. That number is just an aggregate across the country, and it's incomplete because of the aggregation. But I think the methodology is solid. So, sort of following up on on that, uh, I think you said it, uh, the reduction in premium by FHA was obviously helps affordability. No, I didn't say that. Well, I didn't say that. It's as it relaxes constraints. It relaxes borrowing constraints. You said it, well, you would say, I thought I wrote it down. Obviously, helps on affordability. No, no, I said it helps on relaxing constraints. Okay. Um, it, whether it helps on affordability, I, I very much agree, is an open question because, of okay. course, it pushes up prices. It for, pushes up prices. And, okay, and those, that was that was the point. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, Ed. Good morning. I'm Ed DeMarco at the Milken Institute. Morris and Susan, this has been a terrific conversation. I'd like to turn back to um, the cat risk and, and get a little bit more sort of reaction or thought from you about whether um, there's an economic as opposed to a policy, a political reason to have catastrophic risk provided by the, uh, by the government in mortgage. 
So, um, so Stan, in your, at the end of your presentation, you had uh, you made mention of the Crapo Johnson framework, which basically sort of sets out a 10% um, uh, credit market, right? So 10% loss is, is, goes to a credit investor, but the wrap around the remaining 90 essentially creates a, you know, a pure rates market. Um, and is this, in, in essence, by, by having the government use a wrap, does it accomplish two things or not? One is, um, does it create a clear bifurcation between the rate market and the credit market? So you get investors that are properly segmented and not having to um, worry about the uncertainty about whether credit risk is going to bleed over to the rate market. So does that make the market work more efficiently? Um, and then second, uh, the point about if you have losses in residential real estate that are going to start breaching something like a 10% uh, credit protection, um, is this in fact you know, the kind of catastrophic event for which the government is going to be entering or have other safety net issues in some fashion that are going to be threatened, and so does having this set up in advance, again, um, help uh, smooth the market um, and dampen, you know, what the, what the macroeconomic effects of that crisis might be. So I wonder if you could just expand on this a little bit as to the pros and cons of it. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks Ed. So I think in terms of the, the first question, the cre so one way of viewing this is to think about uh, what's happening with the Stacker and CAS program at Fannie and Freddie today which if this was rolled out on a portfolio-wide basis, would essentially create exactly what you said. It would, there would be a rates market where there is no default risk on the front end, and then on the back end, through the stackers, uh, whatever the, the successor of Fannie and Freddie would be called, would be selling off essentially all the credit risk on that product in, in a credit linked note type of, type of instrument, which would be a pure credit instrument. And I think it would have that nice separation. So to the extent that we believe that uh, you know, a liquid market without a, lot of credit, without a lot of credit risk is an important part of the US housing uh, financial system, which I think a lot of people do believe, um, this, would be, this would be a neat separation. There's probably other ways you could create this. By the way, if you had a purely private market, um, there would be securitization and uh, you know a well done securitization with let's say an 80% triple A tranche or maybe a 70% triple A tranche would also be able to function as a safe security without much spillovers from from credit risk to uh, to the rate market so i th i don't think you need a government necessarily to do this i think the private market properly done securitization that's super conservative would would be able to carve out uh, at least 60 or 70 percent um, of that market as, as essentially a risk-free security. So uh, let me just thank you for the question as well and quickly respond to that. Uh, extremely important to have this bifurcation for efficiency of the rate market and the credit market, uh, but it isn't as easy as one might think to create a pure rate market. Uh, and there would absolutely need to be oversight of a private sector in order to have private securitization. Uh, any, any credit risk at all will lead to uh, huge problems and possible uh, unraveling of, of the uh, uh, rate market. And uh, at your second question, what was the second question again? I should have written this down. Really, what I was trying to do is, is identify sort of two oh, reasons that get advanced yeah. for why you would, you know, why it could be um, economically enhancing so to, to, have, um, to have a wrap. One had to do with creating clarity in the marketplace between market mm -hmm. participants that there's no credit risk in the rate market. But the other had to do with um, if you get to an economic situation like we had eight years ago, that in fact this is just a, it's, it's sort of like sort of pre-establishing, you know, a, a shock absorber that is going to at least help dampen or pr provide a ready-made, you know, a cushion for handling some of that macroeconomic shock of a huge right. downturn. 
Right. So that's, I mean, in fact, that's what's happening in, in my model. Uh, the, the, the reason catastrophic insurance is valuable in the model is because it puts a floor under the, under the shock that the banking sector needs to absorb. And if it's a really bad state of the world, it provides a cushion for the banking sector, allows it to continue functioning, uh, making loans to the rest of the economy. So that clearly, that's the advantage of that catastrophic risk insurance. Now, I should emphasize that even in a private market, the banking sector will set itself up with enough capital to also have that own shock absorber. So the, the banking sector will save, and again, in the model, the banking sector will save to, so that it can make loans in very bad states of the world as well. So the difference between a government-mandated catastrophic risk insurance and private sector behavior in the model is really not all that different. The private sector does a reasonably good job saving for that catastrophic state of the world. Now, so now there's like two reactions you could have. You could say, well, I don't really trust the banking sector to do that anyways, because we know that there's lots of conflicts of interest. Bank, the, the shareholders of the banks are not the managers of the bank and so forth and so forth. So I think that's one reasonable view, especially in light of what transpired. Another reasonable view is what you articulated, which is, look, I mean, at the end of the day, um, the government is going to have to bail out the banking sector one way or another, be it through deposit insurance, be it through too big to fail guarantees, we might as well charge for some of this upfront in the form of a small uh, catastrophic guarantee fee. And, and, and more than just the charging, it needs to have information. And for the return for the uh, catastrophic insurance, there needs to be information provided to the whole market because I am not at all as optimistic as Sin is about the private sector doing a reasonably good job and theoretically, in a paper that uh, I've done with Andre Pavlov, the inevitability of the underpricing of risk. Once the underpricing of risk starts off, it becomes market-wide. It is inevitable. So, and that happens extremely quickly. So the 10% is, is good if it can be maintained. The problem is we need to know if it's being eroded over time. We need real-time data. Can I, can I raise one small point? Uh, I, it ultimately depends on who holds the credit bucket, I think as to whether or not this will be better. And the only reason I mention this is, you know, you had big banks taking big bets, like, say, Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers could have very easily bought this credit product, and they could have issued debt to do it. So then you'd say, okay, old, so then who's holding the credit risk? Is it Lehman Brothers, or is it the debt holders to Lehman Brothers? Ultimately, what happened, Lehman was a bad example, so let's take Goldman. Ultimately, what happened with Goldman Sachs, who had a similar trade, is their debt holders, which were bearing the credit risk to this, these kinds of products, not for res, but for other kinds of uh, risk, the debt holders should have been bearing that risk, but they were ultimately bailed out by TARP, and ultimately TARP was financed by tax dollars. So it, you know, if we have a system where the people that are bearing the credit risk will get bailed out, it may not be an improvement. So we, we need, to, need to monitor who's holding credit risk if we're going to go to this system. I, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, it's been a great discussion. And please join me in thanking our panel members. Yeah, sounds good. Let's do that. Perfect. Thank you, Susan. Good to see you more. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, great great to see uh, I want another one. Oh, absolutely. No, thank you.
We'll begin. Thanks very much, and good morning. I'm Alex Pollock of AEI, uh, and this is our panel on international perspectives on housing risk. As we know, housing finance and the risks of leveraged real estate and the endless political desire to run that leverage up are issues for every country. So it's an excellent idea to study and learn from other countries' practices, policies, and experiences, both good and bad, and therefore this panel. In this context, I want to mention there is a quarterly journal, for those of you who haven't seen it, devoted to sharing mortgage lending information uh, and ideas. It's uh, called Housing Finance International, and it's published by the International Union for Housing Finance, uh, of which I should disclose I'm a past president. Uh, but I do recommend you take a look at this journal. As I said, it is quarterly, and you can easily find it by putting International Union for Housing Finance into Google. Today we have a uh, highly qualified and interesting panel to bring us uh, international perspectives, and let me quickly introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, first will be Prakash Lugani, the Chief of Development Macroeconomics for the International Monetary Fund. Prakash has co-edited a special journal issue on housing markets, financial stability, and the macroeconomy. Next will be Wendell Cox, who is a principal in Demographia, an international public policy firm in St. Louis and co-author of the Demographia International Housing Affordability Study, which you'll discuss, which covers more than 375 metropolitan markets uh, in nine countries. Our third panelist will be Andreas Kunert, who is a senior analyst at VDP Research, a subsidiary of the Association of German Fondbrief Banks, uh, Fondbriefe, of course, being the mortgage bonds or the covered bonds we have often discussed. Uh, Andreas focuses on collateral risk management, including measurement of price change in real estate markets and related changes in real estate market risk. Uh, each panelist will speak from 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, then we'll give them a chance to react to each other's comments or to clarify points uh, or to think of new ones uh, if you want. Uh, and after that, we'll open the floor to uh, audience questions, and we'll adjourn promptly at 11 o'clock. And Prakash, you have the floor. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to uh, Ed and Steve for uh, inviting me to participate uh, in this conference. To my knowledge, the first time the IMF has done so, or we've had IMF speakers before, uh, Okay. No, I had an IMF speaker when we compared the Canadian and U.S. housing I finance see. systems okay. a couple of years ago. But okay. anyway, you're most welcome. Okay, thank you. And you uh, have a broader you have, have a broader, a broader perspective. Uh, agenda, yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, I'm sure most of you uh, know about the IMF. Uh, but uh, just to start things out, we, as you know, we are a government agency. Uh, paid for with your uh, taxpayer dollars uh, and the taxpayer dollars of uh, some 180 governments around the world. Uh, our main job is to monitor uh, economic and financial developments in these member countries um, and to do a good enough job that uh, they don't go into crises, which sometimes they do. And when they do, we, we make loans to them. Um, our late great uh, chief economist uh, Mike Musa used to say that uh, the IMF is very good at managing crises. Uh, look how many we've managed to have. Uh, <laughs> but as I said, the, the idea is ideally not to let countries uh, slip into crises, but to, um, through periodic monitoring of economic and financial conditions there, to actually uh, prevent them from, from going into crises. And, um, you know, we have had our share of successes at that as well, but, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, like any form of surveillance. You, you, it's difficult to uh, brag about a crisis you, you, you prevented. Uh, it's, it's difficult to make that point. But 
in the course of this economic monitoring, which we do for most countries on an annual basis, and we issue an annual report, which uh, for historical reasons is called an Article 4 rep report, um, we often provide coverage of the housing sectors in, in these economies. So again, as I said, this is provided to you uh, free because you've already paid for it through your taxpayer dollars. So you can go on our website and download these Article 4 reports, and you will uh, you know, get a, a very good assessment of the economy in general, and often uh, a decent assessment of, of the housing markets as well. Now, you might say, well, that's great, but you know, why should I care about what's going on in, uh, in, in Namibia and uh, Sierra Leone? Uh, if my focus is mostly on, on, on the U.S. and on the U.S. housing markets. Um, there, the pitch I would make is that you, you will find that you can learn a lot from, from the experience of these other countries, even though they, on the face of it, seem, seem very different from, from the U.S. Um, one thing is that, you know, if you look only at the U.S., uh, you know, we end up tending to lay the blame on some poor guy sitting in some cubicle in FHA and saying, you know, but for this guy, there would have not been this crisis, and it's, you know, this specific feature of the U.S. is what led to the crisis. But in some of the data that I'll show you, you'll see that uh, that crisis was actually happening in, I mean, that, that boom and the subsequent crisis actually happened in 60 countries around the globe. So it's difficult to say that there was the ideological twin of that guy in the cubicle in FHA sitting in each of these countries uh, leading to the run-up in prices and collapse. So I think one thing, uh, looking at the experience of other countries, even if your interest is in the end in the U.S., is that it forces you to confront uh, your explanations for why things happened and say, well, does this really uh, stand, stand the test of, uh, of, of the broader evidence? Uh, you know, you, you, you tend to kind of realize you can't kind of just fool yourself into going with, uh, with the evidence you sort of think you believed in. Um, uh, just very quickly, I mean, some years ago, I, 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 it seemed to me my ties were getting shorter, and of course I, <laughs> I, I blame my wife first for not buying the right ones, and I blame the dry cleaners, and then, you know, it took me a while before I realized, you know, I was just getting old, and the, the belly was not going anywhere, and my... <laughs> My ties were starting out, you know, optimistically, I think I can, I think I can, and then they would, you know, reach the spread of the belly and say, well, this looks like a good enough spot to, uh, to settle. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that is what I have found when I go through this housing data set that, uh, that we've assembled is, you know, you think, oh, I, I know why, why the UK, uh, uh, this happened, it's all because of Cameron. But then you see that adjoining countries also, which had very different kinds of governments, had, had similar booms and busts. So I think... To me, um, uh, since most of you, I think, are uh, interested largely in, in the U.S., uh, the, I think what this IMF uh, analysis and data can offer you is, is the wealth of cross-country evidence with which you can then try to narrow down explanations for what happened uh, or what, what is happening in the U.S. Okay. So that's my pitch for why you should, uh, you know, take a look at these Article 4 reports, I've over the years made a futile pitch that we call them economic surveys, but, uh, you know, bureaucracies are reluctant to change, so you, you would have to search under Article 4 reports, and you would get a, a very nice report annually on, on almost every country uh, around the world, and as I said, um, often a very good discussion of housing. So w what would uh, such a global look uh, show you beyond the, the pitch I made? I think uh, at the moment it would tell you that uh, we are not in the midst of the kind of global housing boom that uh, was happening before the crisis. Uh, what we've had is we had a synchronized boom and then we had uh, a, a collapse and now we have a very uh, bifurcated or trifurcated market. Uh, what we had is that we had during the Great Recession a set of countries where prices uh, fell a bit and then recovered very rapidly and where prices have continued to rise. You have another set of countries where prices fell quite a bit 
and are barely now getting out of the, uh, uh, out of the basement. So at, at the very least, you have kind of a two-stage recovery going on. But if you look more, more carefully, you would see that there are actually many different clusters of countries. It's not easily, uh, it's not easy to explain what's going on uh, in the global housing market right now. You would have to come up with three or four different sets of factors for what's going on. So, but at the very least, it's telling us what we saw in the run-up to the crisis is not happening right now. We are not having house prices go up across all the 60 major markets that we monitor. So in that sense, uh, if you had to say, are we setting ourselves up for a huge, another global uh, crash in housing, at least this indicator is, is not pointing in that direction. Um, the second thing, as I said, is that if you were interested in other countries, you would get uh, sort of an assessment of uh, IMF views on the housing sector. And there, I think there are two uh, aspects of our coverage which I think you will find appealing. One is that as data becomes more available, that the IMF staff are doing more and more granular analysis of developments within individual countries. It used to be we looked just at one aggregate house price index for the country. But as we have access to more data, you will see in our reports that we are reporting data by cities, by regions, by different types of buyers, where we have them, and so on. So that, that's, I think, is, is a good feature and would makes the reports of much greater use to you. The second thing which might appeal to you is that we are not automatically jumping to the conclusion that wherever we uh, see a boom, it must be because of leverage or demand side uh, forces. Uh, compared to the past, what I've noticed is that we are emphasizing the role of supply constraints a lot more than we used to. So we are taking, I think, a much more balanced look of why house prices do rise in certain countries and within those countries in certain regions or, or, or certain markets. Okay. And the third thing I would say that um, you will get out of this is that, uh, you know, in this conference and indeed at the IMF, our main approach is to kind of think about housing through the prism of is it a risk to financial stability. Uh, but as we start to do more and more detailed analyses of housing sectors around the world, we realize that you know, housing should be thought of not just in terms of the risk, but in terms of the tremendous potential reward uh, that it can offer to the, uh, to the private sector uh, also. Uh, you know, the development of housing sectors worldwide is quite pitiful compared to what we have in the U.S. and in other advanced countries. Across the world, the problem is too little mortgage f financing, not too much. So there's a huge opportunity here for, for folks to step in. And you also realize when you do this cross-country analysis the tremendous importance of urban and transport policy in shaping housing outcomes. Um, so, I mean, you see that as countries are urbanizing, uh, the role that their governments are playing in these policies um, are, um, are critically important in shaping how their cities are, are, are going. So Ed thought I forgot the PowerPoint. I did not. I just have too many slides to go through them uh, one by one. So I, I thought I would give you the broad picture and then just use the PowerPoint to highlight particular things. So I just concluded by saying, when you look globally, you're, you have to you realize that it's not just about risk but rewards. And uh, here are some slides which I will not go into detail about, you know, why housing matters uh, to people across the world. Um, what are the social benefits from access to housing? This is all in your slide deck. You can look it up later. You see what tremendous opportunities there are for the private as well as public sectors in providing uh, these housing needs, which you know, would really increase social welfare of millions of people across the world. And you see, as I was just saying, the tremendous role of urban policies, because these countries are very rapidly urbanizing. Many of these countries are urbanizing faster than the US did uh, at a comparable stage of development. Latin America, for instance, is one of the fastest urbanizing regions of the world. And so urban policy plays a huge role. Uh, in most advanced nations, you know, the, the play of market forces over time and policies and so on 
uh, dictates a shape of the city that looks a little bit like what I've shown you here for Paris. That is, the densest parts of the cities are closest to the city center, and as you go away from the city center, the density falls. But you have several cases uh, of cities where governments have, have tried to shape the nature of the city rather than leaving it to market forces. And here are three examples where you don't get the shape that you would get in Paris, London, or, or any US city. You get that the densest, uh, that the ur urban centers are basically depopulated and all the density is actually farther away from. Uh, so this is an example of where I think planning is not really the way to go in terms of deciding how, how these uh, cities should shape up, and, and this is a huge uh, factor. Okay. Um, as I said, when you look around the world, you realize that the problem is not one of too much mortgage debt, but too little. Uh, most nations don't have uh, well-developed mortgage markets, and when you look, and look into why that is the case, uh, the standard suspects jump out at you. Um, countries do not have uh, enough legal rights or uh, credit information system or ease in re registering property to allow uh, mortgage markets to develop. So there's a huge challenge there for these countries in, in, in generating these institutions that would uh, lead to the development of mortgage markets. Okay. Now, as I said, um, at the IMF, we do focus like we have at this conference on housing as a source of risk, uh, particularly to financial stability. And I don't have time for this, but uh, I have given you uh, the reference to uh, papers by some of my colleagues that try to distinguish the characteristics of uh, housing booms that end up badly, namely in a recession, from characteristics of booms that do not end up in a recession. Okay. And Generally, as, as we've dis discussed in this, uh, in this conference, uh, the provision of credit goes hand in hand with, with the housing boom that ends badly. So if you have provision of credit beyond a certain threshold, uh, you know, 10% a year, say, for a number of years, the chances that that boom will end in a recession are huge. Okay? That's the main message from this, uh, from this uh, study that we concluded. Okay, and I'll close with uh, our view on the state of housing markets today and then give, give you a flavor of how IMF assessments uh, look like. So as I said, here's where you have the tremendous increase in house prices. So this is an index of 60 countries, okay? And this is equally weighted. So the US is getting the same weight in here as a smaller country like Belgium. And yet you see that there was a tremendous run up in, in housing prices uh, between 2000 and Two and 2006. This is my point that it could not have been something that was very US specific. Uh, something was going on around the world that was making an index of 60 uh, country prices uh, go up. And you can see that you had a collapse and then since then uh, prices at least globally have kind of drifted. Um, on our global housing watch, which was actually released today, the quarterly update, you can get a sense of how house prices are doing around the world you can get a sense of how house prices and credit growth are correlated, and you can get assessments of housing markets. So rather than rely on The Guardian, which wants to shut off home ownership to foreigners, uh, you can get the IMF's assessment of risks. Um, as I said, it tends to um, now tell you a more granular analysis. It gives you what's happening in particular cities, which is what I show on the left and it tries to tell you about what's going on on the supply side, which I've shown on the right. So you can go through your stack and see that we are doing pretty detailed assessments of risks of, of countries around the world, and this is something that is available to you as a free resource. Thanks. Thank you very much, Prakash. Wendell. Okay. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, Dr. Longani has uh, set me up very well. Uh, because I'm going to sound like somebody coming from some place you've never heard before. Uh, and he raised the point about supply constraints, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the housing market, markets, I should say, not market, I, I, uh, from the perspective of, of the retail side. 
housing affordability, middle income housing affordability, which we believe is absolutely crucial to the future of economies, because if housing is not affordable, middle income people can't, don't have as much discretionary income, and they can't buy as many goods and services, and there's plenty of research, as I'm sure you all know, about what the costs of that could be. I've had to change my uh, 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 presentation just a little bit. Oh, let's see here, do I even have it? Uh, how, do, how do I get the... I oh, keep going. Okay. Sorry about that. I think you're going the wrong way, though. Oh, okay. you got to press the eastbound, eastbound button. Oh, you gotta I don't know my directions in this room. <laughs> is, is this the right way? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, That's great. I look forward to seeing this uh, report. <laughs> anyway, I, I start out with a picture of Brisbane. Remember, the G20 was there in November. The leaders agreed to a communique that said we're going to look to improve middle income. We're going to look to improve the standard of living and reduce poverty. Housing policies are doing exactly the opposite at this point, uh, and that is our basic point. Um, the, and what I want to talk about is the extent to which supply differentials largely in land use regulation are making one big difference in housing markets. That's why I don't talk about a housing market. To talk about a, a, a line that looks like this in the United States misses the point completely, as I'll show you in a, in a, in a slide a little bit later. Uh, but in any event, um, let me see if I can recover here somewhat. Well, no. No, a oh, wrong way. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, there, no, there was. I was there. I wonder what happened to it. Oh, there we are. Okay, I think. All right, now, now show this. Good. Thank you very much. Next time I'll come the day in advance for the training. Uh, okay, let's let's go on here. Discretionary income. I've talked about that. So I want to talk about land use regulation and its impact on housing affordability because the differences are absolutely stunning, not only in this country, but in the nine countries that we cover. And we would cover more if we could get comparable data. Unfortunately, much of Europe uh, doesn't look at median prices. They tend to look at median per square foot and without knowing what, or square meter without knowing the square meter figure. Uh, we can't do anything with that. In any event, that's our, our, our cover from last year. We've developed a standard of of measuring housing affordability from a median multiple or median house price to median household income of 3.0 and below is affordable, above five is severely unaffordable. And our justification for that is, a, is work that's been done around the world here out of the Reserve Bank of Australia that looked at price to income ratios in the United Kingdom, the US, Canada, Ireland, the UK, um, Australia, New Zealand. I hope I didn't mention anybody twice. But you notice in the late 1980s all and early 1990s, all of these countries had price to income multiples of under three. And look what's happened since. We've got Australia up there at about five and a half, and you can't find a decent market in Australia under five, regardless of size. So you can see in the next chart here, these are our 10 most unaffordable major markets. Now, we looked at 378. But we also looked at, we, we focus on 86 major markets, which are more than a million. You can see China, of course, Hong Kong very high. By the way, in the five years we've covered Hong Kong, where they have very severe land use regulation, that may sound crazy, but there's plenty of land to be developed in, in Hong Kong. I'm not suggesting that if you were to release, you know, de to, to, to de deregulate land use, it would look like Atlanta, but it wouldn't be 17. It was about 12 when we started five years ago. Vancouver, of course, 10-6. Sydney, 9-8, used to be 3. San Francisco, 9-2, used to be 3. San Jose, the same. Melbourne, unbelievable increases. London, uh, over 8. San Diego, Auckland, and Los Angeles. In any event, all of those markets have very severe housing affordability. And it's important to understand, among the markets we've looked at, no liberally regulated market has ever exceeded five in our 11 years of doing this. So again, I would argue, and I'm not saying, I don't in any way discount the extent to which the credit run-up created the housing crisis. But the reaction of the markets to that, to that availability of credit was much different. 
And that's indicated, I hope, yes, in the next chart where, oh, somehow the printed slide didn't get the, uh, the, the dotted line. You see the top line is California prices to incomes from 1950. Now you notice until 1970, the whole United States, including every single metropolitan market, was below three. And look what happened. And you can read Fischel and others to see what happened in California. And they're increasing the land use regulations now, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, in the other markets that have what we call urban containment policy, which is essentially drawing a line around the city and basically saying we're not going to allow development on the outside, you can see similar increases, much less increases. But notice through the whole bust, the more liberally mark, uh, 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 regulated markets in the United States stayed relatively no low and never got much above three. So I would argue that the whole economic community, forgive me for putting it this way, and you can string me up later, missed it with respect to what went on during the bust. Uh, the fact is, we didn't have a housing crisis. We had a housing crisis in California, in Florida, in Arizona, in Nevada, and a few other places, but much of the country, there were increases, they were big percentage increases, but housing never became unaffordable. Uh, let's see here. Uh, just in case some of you are not aware what's happened in California, largely due to the, uh, obviously, the house price increases, California now has the highest housing-adjusted poverty rate in the country, one-half higher than Mississippi. That's what California land use regulations have done out there. The legislative analyst, by the way, uh, has come up with a similar report a few years ago. Out of fear of going over my time, I'll just skip very quickly over this. You know, you had the UK between the wars. Incredible housing boom. Under Lloyd George, it started uh, huge construction and so on. Then after that, you had the huge, the very difficult um, uh, uh, Town and Country Planning Act, which created a situation that Kate Barker, a more former member of the Monetary Policy Commission Committee in, um, of the Bank of England in doing work for the government, uh, basically said, that land use regulation is why house prices are so out of control in the UK and why they have been so much higher in their increases even compared to the continent. And I would suggest, by the way, while we don't look at the continent because we can't get good numbers, we do have good enough numbers to make some judgments about what's going on in a small town there some of you are familiar with called Paris. And the same thing has gone on there. And again, you go back to the late 80s, early 90s, huge increase in urban planning and land use restrictions. Now, we had in the United States, obviously, the great suburban boom. That's a picture of Lakewood, California. Uh, what I like to call the democratization of prosperity. It has been incredible in what it has done. Uh, don't have time to go into that, but you know, a lot of the urban planning regulations are an attempt to control urban sprawl, and that's fine. But the fact is, and I think the economist, is, I'm really pleased that the economist has come around to a more reasonable position on this issue. They did a special uh, 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 section a few months ago in which they basically said, yes, you can control urban sprawl, but the consequences are severe. And, and it means that people can't afford their houses anymore. Now, uh, just a few things. Now, you know, the, the, the planners will come back and say, oh, what about the environment? What about global warming? All that kind of thing. I've got to tell you, if you, if you think you're going to get people out of, car, out of cars into transit, try $1,000 per ton of greenhouse gas emissions. When McKinsey has told the European Union that the average cost for redu reducing a ton of greenhouse gas emissions should be not minus six euros. And we could go further into that as well. This is the old, this, these are the green belts in the United Kingdom. And you have the same thing going on in uh, similar uh, kinds of things uh, in a number of US uh, cities and Australia and so on. This is Portland, uh, which really was the first place where this kind of policy was implemented in the United States. You see, this is West Union Road, six miles north of when, where I went to high school. Uh, if you want a land, land on the north side, it's going to cost you $16,000 an acre. Raw land, $180,000 an acre under that. We've had the pleasure in our time of having uh, some pretty impressive analysts uh, help us with prefaces to our report. Don Brash, who was the uh, governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand for 14 years, uh, has said that uh, you know where, the, where housing affordability is problem is a problem. You can bet that you have artificial uh, restrictions on the supply of land. The New Zealand government has been incredible 
in their seeking ways to try to turn around their terrible housing affordability crisis. Uh, they've implemented legislation now. Last, within the last couple of weeks, the chief economist of the city of Auckland, where, but mind you, the median price to median household income uh, level is eight at this point instead of three where it used to be. They are now setting a goal of getting back to five by 2030. Now, I'd like them to go back to three, but listen, if they can get back to five, it is really going to be good for the people of Auckland. Uh, Paul Cheshire, economist at the London School of Economics, I think has rightly said from his research that urban containment policy is irreconcilable with housing affordability and price stability. Let's see here. And just to give you a little bit of our research from before, again, not in any way discounting what the credit uh, expansion did, but if you look at where the value increases relative to incomes were in the United States, 73%, you know, between uh, until the layman uh, until the layman collapsed, 73% before the layman collapse were in uh, 11 markets with urban containment policy. More, other more restrictive poli policies that were about 20%. The liberal markets, which were the majority of the markets, only 6%. So I think one thing that was really missed largely in this country is the extent to which there were geographical differences. Now, if you have a country like Australia, you got a problem that the whole country has fallen for this kind of policy, and that's the problem. Canada's another issue. Um, Let's see here. And by the way, we have had some progress. Uh, Florida has repealed its smart growth or urban containment requirements, uh, and we have not seen the kind of escalation of house pricing in recent years that has come back and returned to California, uh, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, we have research out of, the, of MIT that suggests that much of the income inequality suggested by Piketty is in fact in house values, and the researchers suggest that housing regulation has a lot to do with that. Uh, there's a bunch of, reg uh, of, of research many of you are probably familiar with on housing regulation and excessive housing regulation and the, um, the impact on the economy. I think the most interesting is the recent work by, and forgive me if I say his wrong uh, name wrong, Seth, I think it is, at the University of Chicago, Illinois, of, of Illinois, Chicago, and Moretti out of uh, Cal Berkeley, in which they say the mobility changes that have occurred as a result of house price differentials in the United States from 64 to 2009 represent a two a trillion dollar hit to the economy every year. One can argue with those numbers, but the fact is when you interfere with markets that way, that's what you can expect. Uh, let me just finish here. Uh, uh, talking about you know how, criti how critical middle-income housing affordability is. Let me make a couple of comments on Canada because we're doing uh, work up there. I'm running a program. We're much interested in getting at the issue there because I think the real uh, battleground for this issue is Canada at the moment, many of whose cities are going in this direction. I mean, we all know about how bad it is in Vancouver. And everybody says, oh, they don't have any land in Vancouver. Well, they have as much land in the agricultural preserve in Vancouver is they have urbanized land. Now how can you, you know, now, now maybe the median, may, maybe the multiple would only be five, not 10, if they allowed development. And I'm not suggesting they, you know, go and put half acre lots there. The point is they have this blunt instrument of urban containment policy that has created a housing affordability situation that's terrible. And if you think that's bad, consider what's going on in Toronto, where they can develop land all the way to the Arctic, okay? Now, the fact is, in Toronto, they passed in the early 2000s an urban containment policy, and we have seen house prices go from a median multiple of about three to, oh, I'm sorry, about three, five, to about six, nine at this point. On, and, and by the way, for any of you who are interested in, in investing in these kinds of markets, because they're the best investments, I think, in the world, I would certainly suggest you think about looking at Toronto. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Wendell. Very interesting. And my prediction to the contrary, notwithstanding, you got through all those slides in exactly the right time. Good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Andreas. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation uh, to this conference. Um, um, yeah. I will talk about uh, current trends in German residential real estate, and I hope, uh, hopefully, I've come to the same conclusion as the IMF concerning the state of the uh, <laughs> German uh, house prices and house pri possible house price bubbles. 
Um, let me say something about uh, VDP research. VDP research, um, as Alex has mentioned, is a one hundred, not 100% subsidiary uh, of the uh, German Association of Fantasy Banks. 5% are now at the Association of German Cooperative Banks. Um, we, our main asset is the transaction database uh, that we, uh, uh, in, uh, in what we gather data from uh, our institutions. Uh, we have about 500 banks who are delivering data in this database. We have about 3, point, uh, uh, 3 million data sets. Um, and with this data we use, uh, this data we use for um, uh, constructing price in these states for commercial and residential real estate. Um, we monitor residential markets uh, um, and commercial markets. On a lower level, this is for the risk um, um, monitoring of uh, our member banks. And uh, we do also forecasts and uh, valuation at, um, with, we, we are constructing from the database AVMs. And um, we um, deliver this data to the banks, to the greatest banks, the cooperative banks. And um, yeah, that's what we do. And um, in preparation um, of this conference, um, I, saw, um, I saw last two weeks ago this um, cover or this title cover of a German magazine. It's uh, like The Economist in Germany. Um, I try to, um, the next bubble, too much credit too little equity, the new excesses on the real estate markets. And I want to comment on this uh, cover. I'm not of the opinion that there's a bubble in Germany, maybe some hotspots, but not a general. And um, we see, what we see is here the nominal price. This is the VDP, the VDP price in ECs for residential, only occupied housing, multifamily houses. And in Germany, the multifamily houses are not a commercial, it's a residential real estate. Um, uh, I hope and, uh, the regulation will not change it because uh, this uh, will have consequence for the privileged risk weighting in Germany if uh, multifamily houses going to uh, the commercial side. Um, so what we see is uh, we have a fairly stable uh, price increase until 2010, first quarter, and then from that un uh, until um, 2015 Q Q2, we have a residential price increase of plus, uh, plus uh, 23, 3%, uh, 24%. Um, that looks huge, but if you put it in real terms, it will only be 15% in this time span. So that's nothing to, to worry about, I think. Um, the most price increase I'm, uh, in fact in multifamily housing. It's because uh, we... Um, expect or we see um, a lowering on cap rate there, as high as, as, which means that the prices are going up. And the rents are f going up as well, but not as, as much as the capital, cap rate go down. So, but, sorry, but if you compare it to the um, other countries like Spain, we have heard it um, before, or Ireland or the US, um, you see um, in, in, the, in the same time span from 2003 to 2015 or 14 here for uh, 2015 uh, Q1, uh, there's no much of a house price bubble in Germany. Germany is a black line. It's very fa fairly stable uh, price increases. And only at the end, the prices starts a little bit up. And why is that? I want to go uh, drill down deeper in the demand and supply in Germany the situation and um, then I go t um, will comment on the regional distribution of this. Sorry. Oh. oh okay. We sh that was a transaction. This is okay. This, uh, <laughs> um, the economic conditions in Germany are quite stable. You see here, and the the real GDP growth uh, is the blue bars, and uh, compared to the um, GDP, real GDP growth in the euro area. And uh, you can see here that Germany has suffered from, uh, in 2009, uh, has a, a recession and after that um, a recovery. And uh, we are quite outpace the uh, European growth uh, in Germany. So they are very stable compared to the, if you, if you look at uh, the 2012 and 2013, there was a recession in Europe, but in Germany we have positive growth rates, real growth rates. And the other thing is the German labor market conditions. Uh, you see on the, on the right-hand um, figure, 
the blue line on the left-hand scale is the unemployment rate in, in Germany from 2003 to 2014, and the uh, left is the um, development of the labor force. You see, in 2005, there was several uh, laws um, from the Schroeder administration who um, have impact on the on the uh, labor market and uh, to uh, uh, open it up. And so, the, in the aftermath of that, the, the unemployment uh, rate fallen dramatically. It's for fast half of uh, the, the state of uh, 2005. So what that means is that we have stable incomes, we have increasing, increasing incomes in Germany and a quite stable economy. Um, that is all good for the demand of housing. And, um, oh, that's, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I don't know why that is. Do you have it in your slides? Uh, that's the population growth. That's one of the interesting uh, slides that I have in my st stack. Um, as all of the, uh, the development countries, uh, Germany has an age problem and a shrinking uh, natural um, uh, population rate. So, um, but what, what happens here is that uh, in the last, starting with the European debt crisis, we have an inflow from migration all over Europe. And this is um, something what um, uh, was surprising. I, um, for the German um, forecasters of population, but because in, in the population forecast in 2009, um, compared to the population actual in 2000, uh, the, the, the forecast in 2009 for 2013 and the actual population in two four, two, uh, 2014, uh, is, there's a forecast error of 1.7 million people. So, uh, and you can, can imagine that these forecasts are used for construction and everything, so it's come as a surprise in Germany that we have so many people. And, um, and if you see the next forecast, in this come out, it uh, came out in 2015, it's quite uh, young, uh, you see the, the uh, forecast for the German population in the next uh, two years, or the next uh, uh, ten years, it will go up. And it's because of migration, and not um, and so there's a also a de demand aspect of that. Um, and um, I hope this one can also this is an actual problem in Germany is this. Uh, you see the spike there. I hope you. That's the first time asylum applicants. <laughs> um, this is an estimate. It was I think two, uh, three three weeks ago. It was about eight hundred thousand this year. This is the all time high. That's, that's uh, in spite of the aftermath of the reunification, where or the, with the Yugoslavian wars and so on, we have about four hundred thousand. So this is eight hundred thousand is the absolute top level, and the new estimates I've read yesterday about one point five million this year. Every day we have about 10,000 new applicants in Germany. That's a real pr problem. And this has also implications on housing, I think. Uh, <laughs> because yeah. most of them go to, go to the metropolises. Yeah. So, having said that, oh, sorry about, sorry about. Um, uh, that's the construction activity in Germany. Um, I try, okay, but you have the slides. Um, the construction activity, um, we, have, we have a bubble, we had a bubble in Germany, it was in the, um, aftermath, in the uh, aftermath of the unification boom in Germany. Uh, it was in, in the uh, early 90s and uh, it changed in the 95, 96. And after that, um, the construction activity goes dramatically down compared to these figures. And with this construction activity, the whole construction industry goes down or went down. And now, if you see at the, at the, uh, the, the construction activity in new uh, in complete dwellings, in new multifamily houses, and new single family houses, on, uh, started to grow, but on a low level. And um, especially the multifamily houses, because uh, we, we see later the dramatic increase in demand is in the metropolises. So if we have this uh, re-urbanization re re trend in Germany, I think. And um, there's a green line, <laughs> should be, um, where the estimated yearly demand from 2015 to 2020 is depicted is about 200 
72,000 dwellings, but we are actually have around 200,000 this year. So the supply comes not in with demand, so we have a uh, demand, um, excess demand on this, on this market. Maybe this is some why the prices are increasing in Germany. And on the other hand, um, okay, ha. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> We have the. If you want to have a bubble, you you must have uh, some fuel, and that's normally the credit side. And um, this is the financing conditions uh, depicted in the effective interest rates of German banks, uh, new business, housing loans to households with collateral, initial rate fixation of over ten years. That's a n normal credit type in Germany, and you see that the dramatic decrease of effective interest rate in Germany, which of course, is um, uh, has something to do with the European debt crisis. Of course, the aftermath of the housing price bubble burst in America, and um, some EU, 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 EU problems. Um, and um, okay, this one sh is a fuel for a possible bubble. And oh <laughs> my God! And this is a <laughs> this is a study. Um, from my colleague Thomas Sofa. Um, this is um, not. This study is not um, out publicly yet, so you are the first one to see it. It will be published next week by the, by the VDP, and I think the writer of the uh, Economist from the Next Bubble um, hasn't read it. Con uh, couldn't read it. So what is here is you see on the uh, uh, three graphs uh, from uh, left to right the price to income ratio. Uh, house owning this is a study which um, will conduct it every three years so and this uh, and, and we depicted houses owner occupied condominiums owner occupied and condominiums leased and you see on the left hand side the price to income ratio is about uh, uh, with houses this is about six uh, this is what the affordability index is r really high um, but I think it's it's in the fairly uh, stable, and um, in condominiums unoccupied we are at 5.7, and condominiums leased, um, interestingly, at three. So the loan-to-value ratio uh, is about uh, under 80 percent. Uh, so um, I think that's a very stable. Of, um, the, the only thing is in the housing sector, the houses unoccupied, is the loan-to-value ratio is a little bit rising, but I think not in a very a uh, dramatic way, so it's all stable. And uh, on the right-hand side, that is, I think, the positive uh, picture is that the debt-to-service-to-income ratio is shrinking or decreasing. So from from this side, I think there's no uh, um, there's no fueling of a, pos a potential bubble here. Um, okay, this is a broad picture. We have learned yesterday and today that we have to drill down more, and we do that in Germany, of course, but. Um, I give you that. Um, this is uh, only occupied housing. I've uh, drilled it down uh, on the right hand side. So you see that for the two, uh, 402 dis different districts in Germany, the real price increase from 2007 to 2014. You see the red ones are the metropolises um, Berlin, of course, is red, uh, Hamburg, uh, Dusseldorf, Cologne, Frankfurt. Stuttgart and Munich, of course, and the Munich area. So here we see have price increases about real price increases about this time period of seven years, about uh, thirty percent real in real terms. And if you go, this is uh, only occupied housing is consistent of uh, condominiums and of uh, single family houses. If you have only condominiums, it would be twenty uh, thirty five to thirty to, to forty percent. This is a weighted index, so. Um, yeah, but here is it. Uh, what it, what happens is um, that um, you can see that the nominal price increase on the left hand side. What happened here is that uh, alone Berlin alone has the last four years, I think, about one percent of population growth per year. So there's a lot of demand in these cities, and it's, it's the same with Munich, the same with uh, Hamburg, uh, Düsseldorf, Frankfurt. You see, we have a, a, a overwhelming de demand. We have low vacancy rates, so there is no no supply there. A strong, uh, st uh, um, strong land use regulations. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
Okay, yeah, I come to my one minute. One minute. It's enough, I think. Um, so to sum up, um, the key factors for the current price increase are historic low interest rates, improves the affordability of housing. Uh, we have in Germany persistently stable employment income perspectives uh, that stabilize housing demand. Uh, substantial inflow of immigrants uh, uh, that overcompensates the negative natural population growth in Germany. Uh, weak, there's combined with the reconstruction activity does, which does not uh, meet housing demand. Uh, the conclusion is uh, for me that for Germany as a whole, there are still no signs of a housing bubble, um, stable loan to value and debt service to income ratios. Um, we have rising redemption payments or principal payments. Um, and longer fixed interest periods, periods uh, that indicate risk awareness on behalf of German banks. Um, of course, there are significant, significant regional difference in price and rent development due to local housing market conditions. Uh, we learned ab loud, um, about that, uh, of that here, that we have to look, take a deeper look at that, and we do that. And um, strong price increases in some cities have to be carefully monitored. I think that is what the IMF says. That says is, is what the Bundesbank says, and is what the ECB says. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, Prakash gave us the IMF assessment of risk for Germany, which is in the package, which I just turned to here. It agrees with you, Andreas, that although German house prices are rising, there are no signs of overheating, it says. But Wendell, it goes on to say, the strength of markets, by which it means rising prices, um, in the center of the largest cities where supply restrictions are the tightest po points to an important role of housing supply factors. So we, we I seem don't think to we be can get any more agreeable than that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we seem to be moving uh, to consensus here. Uh, this also, I think, ties uh, very nicely with uh, Ed Pinto's and Steve Oliner's work on the land uh, factor in housing and, and and in speculation and greater greater leverage uh, of land uh, in real estate cycles. I guess you could think of the whole history of the United States as one vast land speculation. Uh, moving from east to west. Uh, when they got to California, Wendell, they ran out of land, so then they restricted it, I guess. Yeah, but it took about 150 years before they <laughs> realized the problem, apparently. I want to give the, uh, uh, we had three, I think, very interesting presentations. I want to give uh, each of the panelists maybe uh, two minutes or, or so, uh, just to add anything you want to add in reaction to other people's uh, comments or uh, additional points you want to make. We'll just go down the, go down the panel. So, Prakash? Um, I, Ed, I was just going, I mean, um, um, Alex, I was just going to um, read out the, the Canada assessment that you did just to point out that it is indeed very similar to uh, what we heard. And on Canada, too, uh, if you read our assessment, which is also in the packet in the background slides, you, you will see that we have the same views about uh, how Vancouver, in the case of Vancouver, too, it's clear that uh, the supply restrictions are playing a huge role uh, in, in driving up the prices there. So that's yeah, very quickly. Um, but what I didn't get a chance to say is, you see, the problem here is that the international urban planning community is absolutely committed to imposing Vancouver, Sydney, and Portland-style land use regulations all over the country, and I mean all over the world. And this is something I very much appreciate the work that IMF has done, OECD has done some wonderful work, and so on. But if there is any hope whatever, about preserving the strength of the middle class in the world, we got to deal with this problem. Thank you. Andreas, additional comments? Uh, by the way, uh, before you do, l let me just apologize on behalf of AEI for following up your PowerPoints there. But you carried on gloriously, nonetheless. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the real problem in, 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 um, in Germany now is uh, what do we do with the, with the waste amount of asylum seekers? And what will happen in the next years uh, where, we, where we put them? The, the metropolis you have seen, there's a reach, huge house price increase over the last years, and it will continue ev eventually. And um, this is the greatest concern I, I, I have pers personally for, for Germany. Yeah. So, um, and we have strict regula uh, regulations there, and, and, and the city like Munich is very, it's tight, and the surroundings of Munich are also tight, and so I don't know where we go from from here. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Prakash. I'd like to begin the questions with one one of my own for you because the the 
international uh, uh, pattern of numerous housing bubbles in the 21st century. Just, of course, when the central bankers had announced that they had discovered how to manipulate things so that we would always have a moderation and that they had discovered the great moderation. And then we had this worldwide uh, pattern of housing bubbles. It wasn't everywhere, though. Obviously, it wasn't in Germany, but it was many places um, uh, that we, we saw really out of control bubbles, such as uh, in the UK. Uh, of course, and a huge one in Spain and Ireland and Iceland and in the U.S. otherwise. And of course, uh, you put up the Canada assessment there, but, but Canada's house prices relative to the uh, year 2000 are far over today where the, uh, where the U.S. prices were at the very peak of our bubble. So, so there's an international question here. Do, can you make a few more comments, and, and we'll give you some more time to do it, about uh, how we should understand uh, this, this uh, fact that there were, in, in, in at least a significant number of countries, uh, this uh, huge boom uh, in house prices? How, how should we think about that? Uh, yeah, but thanks. I mean, I, I, again, if you think back to the chart that I had up about the global house price index, so that was an average of 60 countries, and you saw just a dramatic increase from 2002 to about 2006. Now, it's true that it didn't increase in every single country. Germany was one of the exceptions, indeed, over that period. But it did increase in many, many countries. And then when you look a little more carefully, you do find that, indeed, in many countries, there were programs similar to our own motivated by similar concerns of affordable housing. So when you look through the details, you do find even in Spain, even in the UK, buried in here and there, there were the same kinds of motivations. So it's not... Ah, so there was that guy in the office at the equivalent of the FHA. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I mean, as I said, I, I'm, not tr I'm not trying to say that when you dig deeper that your explanations will not prove, uh, turn out to be right. They could be. So, but it wasn't the case everywhere. So I think that saying that this was all due to uh, a common motivation of governments everywhere to increase affordable homes will, not, will get you some part of the way, but not all the way. So I think the other explanation is something that actually was discussed a bit in the previous panel, is the role of, of China and the enormous uh, savings that is being generated. So I think you clearly have a situation uh, over the last couple of decades where countries like China, India, many other emerging markets are getting richer, but they don't have the level of financial development yet where their citizens can invest in, in domestically. So you just do have this huge uh, pool of savings that is searching for a home. And so I think that is indeed a common factor that, that explains some of the rise. And I've done some work, uh, which I'm actually presenting tomorrow at the Minneapolis Fed, that talks about how uh, global liquidity is one of the drivers. So I think, I, I don't think that the data will support one explanation, but I think uh, increased savings uh, as, as, as a fuel, combined with the desire of many, many governments to provide affordable housing, I think gives to me the two big factors that, that can explain, explain the run-up. Can I? Can I? Yeah. The other, yes. Yeah, a couple of comments on that. One, I think, I think you, you know, it's reasonable to suggest that the central banks need to understand where policy is being made. My sense is in Canada, monetary policy is being made by the land use authorities in Vancouver and Toronto. And this is a big deal. Same thing if you go back and look at the run up of the prices in the last decade in Australia, which of course didn't have the big bust that we had, uh, and New Zealand where the central banks did all sorts of things to try to cool the market and nothing worked. Why? Because they had overwhelming supply problems that, that forced, uh, at least I believe, forced the prices up. And, and secondly, with respect to China, no question, I mean, let's face it, Beijing is driving a lot of the price uh, uh, dynamics, especially of the US and Canadian West Coast. At the same time, are Chinese investors driving up the price of housing in Dallas or Houston or Atlanta? Now, it's not just that Dallas and Houston or Atlanta aren't as nice to a lot of people as are Seattle and Vancouver. 
But in Seattle and Vancouver, you have house price. You you have the restrictions that force the prices up and make them attractive. And I and so I think that's another thing to keep in mind. We can blame foreign investment, and I don't. But across Canada, what you get is this, this thing that is all the Chinese, or you know, some places it's all the Russians. The fact is, if the supply regulations allowed the building of houses, the problem would be less than it is with the supply regulations. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. And then, Andres, just to warn you, I want to come and we're going to get to you to ask why Germany was an exception yeah, to, I, the, just, to just, the many yeah. bubbles in, in a minute. Go ahead, Prakash. No, just to clarify, I mean, I, it's not, it's, I, I mean, I don't want to come across as, as, as blaming the Chinese if I did. I mean, yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is there is a pool of savings, and indeed, what you can think of is that that's, that's the source of funds that's coming in. Where it lands is indeed guided by supply regulations and, and myriad other things. So, yeah. I think we can say, well, I, while you're still thinking, Andres, uh, 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 I think we can say in general, of course, there are bubbles in other things, not only housing. Housing is the most dramatic ones and maybe the most damaging ones. Uh, but you can have bubbles in uh, commodities. We had, a, we had giant oil price bubbles. You have bubbles in the stock market and so on. And there very often are uh, associated huge foreign inflows in, in which reinforce uh, the dynamic of the bubble. Now, Andreas, so why, is, why was Germany an exception uh, to the, to the uh, housing uh, bubble pattern? Uh, in the aftermath of the uh, bust from the German, uh, German re uh, reunification boom, uh, I think they, are, they changed the standards for, for um, mortgage lending value in Germany. So we have uh, changed the whole system of uh, get a market value, not a market value. Uh, if you uh, want to um, um, issue in a fan brief or a covered bond, then you uh, needed a mortgage lending value, a German Beleihungswert. Hmm? Um, we have a whole act about that. <laughs> um, and uh, this is uh, a sustainable value. So in theory, it should be uh, what you call intrinsic value. I think it's uh, the same uh, theoretical, more found um, uh, um, term. It is um, a stable value over the, um, main, um, over the whole loan period. So it should be a value of about 30 or 20 years, how long the loan uh, will be in action. So this is a stabilizing element, I think. Um, how to get this sustainable value is another question. <laughs> it's very different uh, or very difficult to, to uh, the theoretical concept of a, of a, a mortgage lending value. And uh, you have, of, of course, a housing cycle and then you have to, uh, I think you have to um, um, extract a trend, something like a trend of that. But it's not a mortgage lending where the mortgage lending, in, in, in fact, in Germany is uh, a value at risk value, I think, of the, of, the, of, the, of the market value. So it's the lowest as you can get over the cycle. Um, the second thing is, I think we haven't spoken about the home ownership rates in different countries. And Germany has a very low home ownership rate. So we have about 45%, I think, is it your table, Prakash? Um, and compared to Spain, where my wife is from, is from 87%. So that is, uh, I think this is a stabili also a stabilizing element because you have always the opportunity to rent. You have to buy a house or you have to, to take a credit risk. And in Germany, it, uh, also, there's a very uh, good rent market. So you can buy, uh, you can rent a, a, a condominium in the same uh, fit out or the same location as you can buy it. So you have the opportunity to, to switch. Yes. And I, I think that's a, a, another stable, stabilizing element in Germany. Thank you. Very interesting comments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to come to your questions. Uh, I see some hands already, and I'm, I'm going to start in the back and work around. Uh, first, we're going to go way to the back there, because we don't want to ignore the people sitting in the back. And uh, re may I remind you, when you get the microphone, tell us your name uh, and your affiliation, please, and then ask your question. If you feel compelled to preface your question with comments, the chair will remind you to come promptly to your question. Thanks. Yes, please. So I have a question for Wendell, but 
it's a comment slash question. Is that okay? As long as the comment is, is short and to the point. Okay. Um, we should just move on. <laughs> Go ahead. Don't, don't, be, don't be intimidated by the chair. Go ahead. All right. Okay, so Wendell, I, I, there are a lot of us back here. I, I guess the question for you is, do you really, the question about supply constraints at the metro area, are you sure they're that important? And the reason that we ask, there's two reasons that we ask. The first is that the housing bubble, we know, occurred in places, in plenty of places where land was cheap and plentiful and that's Phoenix and Vegas and San Bernardino and Riverside and Minneapolis, places like that. The second thing is that um, because of patterns of trade, it's not clear that relaxing supply restrictions would do anything. So if you just allowed people to build more units in San Francisco, people would move in, if, but prices would still be high. If you allowed more units in London, I think all of Europe would move to London now if it could. So people would move in, but the price of housing would still be high. So I I'm, would ask you to clarify your points on land use restrictions, given those observations. Very good and direct question, Wendell. Yeah, and let me give a direct answer. Oh, let me see here. Uh, our, our Can you hear? It should be green. Oh, is it green now? Can you hear? OK, good. A uh, very direct answer. The housing bubble principally was in the expensive markets, I'm sorry to say, not the less expensive markets. The places where house price, where multiples went to 5, 6, 7, 9, and 11 were Phoenix, by the way, which had much of the land in the suburban area owned by the government of the state of Arizona, which was auctioning it to supply the market, and you saw the price of land go up at the same rate that it went up over the last over the same period of time uh, in the research by Jerko and others in Beijing. Same thing with respect to, to uh, Vegas. Everybody loves to look at Vegas and say, oh, look at all that land. How could that have happened? I'll tell you how it happened. The government, the US government, owns most of the land. And again, in their auction program, the price of land per acre over six years went up almost the duplicate of Phoenix and Beijing, okay? Now, if you look at where the bubble, where you got all these high multiples, everybody else stayed down around three. All these high multiples happened where there are very severe land use regulations. Now, if any of you don't believe that supply regulations have something to do with price, I urge you to look at the oil industry. Secondly, you have to think about uh, the, the you know, let's see here, there was another, oh yeah, what, what would happen, first of all, I, I agree, there could be real problems in, reduce, in, in improving housing affordability if you were to go into San Francisco now and deregulate. Why? Because an awful lot of that land has been, uh, been bought up. And the fact is those prices on the periphery are higher. When I talk about the problems in London, I am not talking about the GLA or the area within the green belt, which, by the way, ought to be developed. But I'm talking about the prices within the southeast area of England where there is plenty of land to develop. There is plenty of land to develop in the San Francisco Bay Area. In fact, you know, if San Francisco were to sprawl as it were, at the same population density as the New York urban area, it would be able to go well beyond Stockton, et cetera. There's no shortage of land. Yet, with California's house, uh, with ha California's land use regulations, which as I indicated are only gonna get worse, we saw during the bubble price to income multiples in Modesto go to seven. They didn't even get the three in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. So, so the basic point is that, uh, you, you know, your, your, the, the basic point is that these supply restrictions make a huge amount of difference, and you can find, as I indicated before, no place where they've ever hit five, 
where there is this, where there is not this kind of, of, of regulation. And why is it that, you know, you know, I remember a long, long time ago in the early 70s where you could buy new houses, 2,200 square feet for $22,000 when the median house price in this country was about 23 on, in the suburbs of Los Angeles. You can't do anything like that anymore. Thank you. That was the perfect opening question. Thank you. I have way in the back here, please. This is, I'm George Mann with myself. Uh, this is for Andreas. The immigration for 2010 to 13 was probably from Spain and other Euro countries, and you had people with uh, Euro experience and probably could learn the language pretty quick. Now with the mammoth immigration coming from the Middle East and Asia, and you have probably low skill, non-familiarity with Europe, and non-familiarity with the language. What kind of talk is going on in Germany to house these people, uh, get them involved as productive citizens, again, initiate them into the German and the Euro culture overall? I mean, it's obviously a massive number of people, probably the most since the World War II or so. Yeah, thank you for this interesting question. <laughs> um, maybe I should give you the number of Angela Merkel. Um, <laughs> but I didn't have him. Um, it's very <laughs> this is a very, very hard question. Um, you, are, you are right. In, in the aftermath of the Euro, uh, or in the Euro debt crisis, I think that the, most of the immigration came from, from Europe, from Spain and uh, Greece and... Uh, and um, but nowadays, uh, it's, of course, it's a different type of uh, um, um, asylum seekers, not immigration asylum seekers, uh, which came from Syria. But in fact, I think we don't know what these people are, what the talents are. There is some anecdotal evidence that there are medicine uh, um, doctors uh, beneath them or high, highly qualified persons. I don't, other, I don't know. I think the government in Germany, um, it's my opinion, uh, don't, don't know either. You know. It's a, it's a, it's a huge, um, it's something, um, li I think, like a black, black swan move, uh, moment in Germany. We don't know what, what happened. No? Sorry. Very, very interesting. And let me come back here, please, the, uh, at this table. Thank you. Speaking to uh, affordable housing, do you feel like there is a Could good... Could you tell us who you are, please? Hi, my name is Beth McDowell. I um, run Counterparty Risk at Caliber Home Loans. And uh, speaking to affordable housing, do you have some theories or hypotheses around um, the housing to rent ratio that drives affordable housing? And do you also believe that rent control in your analysis of rent control versus um, non-rent control that, ha that has any kind of... Um, stability around housing prices. Um, yeah, we do. We do look at uh, in in our global housing watch uh, on our website. Uh, at least for the OECD countries, we do look at house price to rent and house price to income ratios. Um, I, I don't. The OECD does as good a job as it can in trying to make these comparable. It does take into account, in some cases, the extent of rent control, subsidized housing, and so on. But I think they would admit that these are not really the best uh, stats just to look at. In many cases, you just have indices, so you don't even have real uh, transactions-type data that is giving you true multiples, as, as in Wendell's data. So. Uh, I think we do provide it, but I would sort of put a huge uh, buyer's caution uh, next to those statistics. Yeah. Any other comments on rent versus? Okay, I had a I had a question way in the back here. No. Steve. Steve. Yeah. Oh, thanks, uh, Steve Olner. This is a question for Wendell. Quick one. Do you publish? Um, measures of land use restrictiveness by the metro area? I mean, you talked about the restrictions in qualitative ways, but you actually have quantitative indices, and if so, how are they constructed? 
Well, first of all, we're we're not uh, we're not doing this in the same way that an economist, you know, might go in and do an econometric analysis of 50 or 100 markets or anything. We look for things. We look for smoking guns. Okay. You want a smoking gun, you go to Sydney and you look at the land use restrictions in Sydney and you notice that there's an urban growth boundary that doesn't permit building outside the periphery of the city. Or you go to Melbourne and you find the same thing. Or you go to Auckland and, and, and you find the same thing. So that's really the crucial issue. We also, look at, we also look at metropolitan plans and so on to look at other issues to see if there are other things. Like, for example, if you have huge... Um, development impact fees that appear to be way out of line, you can bet that that's going to have an impact. And then you compare that with the more traditional kind of land use regulation that preceded the Portland style, California style, and Vancouver kind of regulation. And I'm not talking about the kind of thing like you've still got in Texas where, you know, realize that a county can't even restrict building. And is, is, if, as long as you've got the land and can pass some simple environmental uh, issues, you can build in Texas. We're not talking about deregulation or anything like that. We're talking about things that are just sort of like Euclidean zoning kinds of, of things that preceded this adoption of urban containment policy. So, no, we don't publish that. We simply review that because we have limited resources. Um, and, and then we make our judgments based upon that. We wish you greater resources as you go forward. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, a, a related question, Wendell. Um, in your presentation, you talked about the middle class and, and allowing the, the, the democratization of property ownership uh, or home ownership uh, to the middle class and it's being uh, um, hindered by these land use uh, restrictions. It's sometimes argued that this is actually a kind of a social or economic class issue, that the people who are already quite affluent and like their places where they overlook the forest or they overlook the ocean or something, are the ones who push the land use restrictions um, and, and therefore stop other people from being home homeowners. Do you th do you think that sort of class or class uh, social or economic class story has some reality to it? Oh, there, yeah. I mean, the whole NIMBY thing. There's no question about that. But I do think we need to be careful about letting uh, the planners off on that. Um, I've looked. I've just finished in my last slide. I should have pointed it out. We published yesterday a new report. I work with Frontier Center in Canada, though I'm an American. And we just published a major report yesterday, uh, a survey of the academic evidence with respect to housing affordability and so on. And any of you that would like the link to it, I'll be glad um, uh, to give it to you. But the um, um, as, as regards sort of the nimbyism and so on, uh, I, in, in writing this paper, we went back and really looked closely at the theory out of the best thinkers in the urban planning community in the United States. And they're good thinkers, and they're people I like and have a lot of respect for. But, but some of the best out of Oregon, where this really started, um, ba you, you look back at what they were writing in the 1980s, and they're saying, and I'm overstating the case here, Boy, are we lucky that they didn't notice or that they didn't find house price increases in Salem after the first urban growth boundary was impacted because we probably never would have seen any more of it again. Now, the state of the research also in urban containment policy is also, I think, pretty difficult in the early years because, again, it was, it was not done by people like you that study housing markets. It was done by planners. And so if they didn't see the price going up like this immediately after the imposition of the urban growth boundary, they presumed everything's okay. As in a matter, and as in a, a matter of fact, until the mid-90s, after 18, 17 years of an urban growth boundary in Portland, there wasn't much different. Why? Because the first urban growth boundary consider, continued, had so much land in it, nobody needed to be concerned. But the fact is you've got to look at this, uh, at, at this kind of thing all along. And my basic point is I am not sure, and I know of no place in the world where in adopting an urban containment policy, the, the policy makers were faced with expert testimony that was considered that said, and by the way, you realize what's going to happen to housing affordability here. Prices are going to go up by two and three times. You're going to see more people in poverty and, and less affluence. Nobody even had that discussion. And so my point is, no, I'm not sure. 
I, I, I am not sure that voters would have en masse supported the idea of increasing poverty. That doesn't, now granted, you go to Ventura County and there are people that are doing their NIMBY thing and so on, but I really have to blame the whole process of the political process that came up with these approaches that failed to look at what anybody who understands the oil industry should have looked at. Okay, we're gonna, we have time for one more question, and it's going to be Ed Pinto. <laughs> because he has a special status in this conference. <laughs> okay. Uh, Andreas, uh, so I'm looking at uh, your chart, this chart here, uh, and in metropolises, it looks like a near 30% increase in the last five or six years nominally. So my question relates to mortgage lending value, which is supposed to uh, be a sustainable value. At, on the ground level, where people are actually doing mortgage lending values on single-family dwellings, are they actually finding a problem between market price, current market price, and sustainable value, and having to cut the value because of that? Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, I'm yeah, of course they have uh, in in areas like Munich, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course. There's a, a growing tension between the market side and the risk side, of course, because uh, they, uh, the market side says, okay, uh, the market value is like this, and the risk side has to say, okay, but sustainable value is, you have to cut down the loan a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's uh, the momentum where the market value lies way in, in several areas, where the, in Berlin or Munich, where the market values are lying way ahead of the, of the mortgage lending value. Well, that uh, comes to a fundamental principle in all this, which is if you want to pay a high price with your own money, with your equity, that's one thing. If you want to pay a high price with the money that I'm lending you, that's, that's something different. Are we going to a coffee break next? So coffee break next. Let's appreciate this excellent panel. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
Seat. Steve. Uh, please take your seats. Uh, we've got uh, two more uh, presentation sets to get through. I'll be talking uh, about the appraisal area generally, and then we'll have a panel um, that will present on appraisals and discuss appraisals, and then we'll finish with lunch after that and some discussion. Um, and we're going to be handing out uh, the, the question that Steve asked, and this is the partial answer. Uh, and you'll, I, I printed off a bunch of copies, but uh, this is the land use restriction relationship to housing and affordability in 2013, the ranking of the cities that uh, Wendell and Demography had done back then, uh, green being cities that had um, less restrictive land use um, uh, regulation uh, and also unaffordable uh, or moderately unaffordable housing, which was a score four or below and then those that had more restrictive that were 4.1 and above. And uh, you can see um, that uh, there are uh, very few that had land use restrictions that are below four, and uh, there are very few above four that didn't, that uh, were liberal. Uh, and so you can see what the ranking is as that is handed out. Um, again, uh, the, uh, uh, with homage to uh, Alex, and uh, there's nothing new in uh, real estate fin in, real in finance, much less real estate finance. Uh, this is uh, the uh, hearings on the uh, 1934 National Housing Act when it was originally passed, and the purpose was to prevent, one of the purposes, to prevent speculative excesses in new mortgage investment. And that was one of the explicit purposes was also to eliminate the necessity, apropos to the discussion about second mortgages, to eliminate the necessity for second mortgage financing, um, because that was viewed as a great evil back in the 30s, after what had happened in the 20s and early 30s. So uh, we're still trying to make some of these things happen, but uh, things move very slowly. Uh, you should all have as a handout in the, the, the bibliography of historically significant uh, valuation of mortgage risk documents. I have to... Uh, uh, acknowledge Susan Wachter's uh, role in this. I think two years ago when uh, at conference number two when I presented on the uh, evolution of valuation, she came up and said two things. Ed, A, it's a devolution, not evolution. <laughs> and B, you really need to dig more into this because there's got to be more. At the time, I think I had found four or five books, uh, McMichael and May and a couple others, um, and so I re, uh, uh, returned to the task, and that's when I found uh, about Ely and all of the people that came out of the Ely uh, uh, influence. Uh, and so there's now nearly 100 books, documents, hearings, acts, you name it, underwriting guidelines, for FHA, et cetera, um, almost exclusively from... 1900, there's actually a little bit before 1900, but from 1900 uh, to roughly 1970, um, uh, most of them uh, before 19, you know, the vast majority before 1960. And many of them were recently added, the ones in yellow highlight, and there's about 30 of them or more that were added, that I've added just in the last number of months. Uh, every time I start looking, I, I keep finding more, and it keeps uh, uh, illuminating what our history was and how Again, there's nothing new in, in, uh, in finance. Um, so I'd like to uh, start by talking about um, the appraisal of the future today, back to fundamentals. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I've done some of this at previous conferences. Um, the uh, beginning is uh, those who ignore history. Uh, this is an excerpt from a, a paper by... Uh, uh, Richard Weiss back in uh, the late 80s, and Steve and I had the privilege of actually spending three hours at dinner with him about two months ago um, and talking about what he had written here and, and also talking about the National Home Ownership Strategy, which he had a hand in drafting at HUD uh, in the 90s. Uh, and he pointed out in his paper uh, that in the 1920s, market price and market value were considered to be identical and that appraisal was primarily a method of determining market value utilizing the current price. 
and that Ely, Babcock, Fisher, and others basically dissented from this. And then after the uh, uh, collapse of house prices and the interest in the 1934 Housing Act in stopping this uh, speculation uh, from entering in mortgage lending, um, they were the proponents of that view that you could actually try to stop that and um, that you would promote stable and affordable home ownership um, by arguing that the market prices and real estate values are actually distinct and over the long term appraisals must be free of the effects of the boom psychology, misinformation, and speculative cycles. And uh, Fisher went on to do research in 1951 that he published that found that the liberalization of credit terms during creates market pressure that easily becomes capitalized into higher prices when undertaken in a seller's market. And he did some uh, 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 testing of that with F both FHA as one group and then with VA loans as another. Um, that we've now sort of replicated with our research uh, that Steve and I have done on the, uh, the drop in the FHA financing premium, which is the equivalent of a liberalization of credit terms. And so what happens is that that liberalization fuels uh, a seller's market. If the seller's market's already there, it, it enhances it. If, it has, if it's not there, it tends to create one uh, by increasing demand and the supply, uh, uh, demand shock and pressure, and the supply is very slow to respond. Uh, and that creates a, and interrupts the normal feedback loop, uh, and, and you get the kinds of uh, regional booms and, and national booms that, in my, that we had. Uh, Low-income owners are particularly harmed by this because, as we've uh, demonstrated with our land research, what you're really doing is speculating in land, and that is the riskiest piece of the real estate uh, packet to speculate in is the land. And as we saw from Steve's presentation yesterday, you know, land values went up 1,800%, or whether if it's really 1,500, whatever the number is, it was huge in Riverside, San Bernardino, and other places uh, in the LA market. And the only, you know, that, that can't be good for low income buyers to end up with that speculation in land. Um, and uh, they all ended up losing virtually, you know, if, if they owned the house, um, they ended up virtually losing that entire speculative uh, uh, increase. Uh, Richard Ely is uh, the first one that really created this as an area, academic area, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, and his motto was under all the land. I mean, he understood that land was really the fundamental uh, issue here. Um, Richard Hurd uh, wrote the first treatise on city, which then was just non-farm. It didn't mean metropolises. It just meant non-farm. They knew how to value farmland. It had an economic value. You could grow crops on it, et cetera, and it was well known how you would value farmland and, it, and its, uh, the quality and, and uh, its productivity and the cost of doing so. Um, but they didn't know how to value city land, urbanized land. And so he laid down in his introduction a, a series of principles that we found replicated and validated in our land research. Uh, while intrinsic value is correctly derived by capitalizing ground rent, exchange value may differ very widely from that. Uh, value depends on economic rent, rent on location, location on convenience, and convenience on nearness. The intermediate steps may be eliminated, and you may say that value depends on nearness. And again, if you look at the maps that Steve presented, you'll see the places that tend to be close in have the much higher values. Where the exceptions are is where they're occupied by low income tend to be minority families. Um, but when you move out to the outer areas, those are um, lower land prices, lower incomes, and they don't have the utility of nearness. Uh, if a new utility does not arise, then exchange prices may arise, advance and recede, but the intrinsic value doesn't really change, which again is what we showed in those, the bottom tiers. The intrinsic value hadn't changed. They just were speculating in land because of all the other things or all the different reasons that were going on. That was what was happening. And, uh, and as he said, this uh, increase in price can at times just be simply a condition of the public mind, and that kind of uh, follows with what uh, Robert Schiller has talked about, you know, the exuberance. Um, FHA incorporated this into their process uh, thanks to Ernest Fisher and Frederick Babcock, and they called it uh, the character value, and it was really talking about the difference between available market prices uh, and value, and that that would be evident in both boom and depression conditions, and you really only had um, the available market price representing the actual value 
in rare instances. It was when you had uh, stability, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, Fisher's research and liberalized credit term I've already mentioned. He published it in 1951. You have more detail there. This uh, shows the, uh, uh, stylistically how real estate markets are cyclical and constantly changing. It's very unusual, except Germany was one of the exceptions. And uh, Andreas explained in large measure why. Uh, but uh, in general, you don't have a stable point. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't have a theoretical equilibrium point, but you don't, you're not actually at equilibrium much of the time. And in this stylized chart, you, over whatever, you know, there's no uh, time period, but let's say it's 20 years. You're only uh, in uh, equilibrium three times in 15 or 20 years. Um, the rest of the time, you're either exceeding it or undershooting it. And, and so that's an important, uh, uh, Im important thing to realize. Uh, we've already seen the land speculation uh, work that, that Steve talked about yesterday. I think the easy way to think about it in my mind, it's taken me a while to sort of come to this sort of uh, example, a stylized example. If you take uh, where land was cheap in 2000 and you have a $20,000 uh, land share and an $80,000 structure share and you have a $100,000 house, your investment in land is $20,000. Investment in structure is 80. Uh, if it price doubles, you now have a $200,000 uh, market uh, price, uh, and the house went up, and I'm going to keep the numbers simple, from 80 to 100. That's a 25% increase. But the land then is the residual, and as we call that's really the bundle of things called, we call land uh, and utility, and that went from 20000 to 100. Land went up five times, even though the price of the property only doubled. And therefore, if you start with this cheap land, you are speculating largely in land. And it's really then the question about affordable home buyers. How do you possibly put low-income people in your, what you're largely doing if this is what the price cycle is, is having them speculate in land? It can't possibly make a reasonable public policy. If you then go to example two, where land was expensive, and you have a $200,000 house, and uh, the land value is 50% or $100,000, uh, and then you end up uh, having the price go from 200 to 300. As Steve demonstrated, the, the more expensive places didn't go up quite as much in the same metro area. Um, and you now have a land share of 58%. They went from 50 to 58. Um, they were not speculating nearly as much in land. Yes, the land still increased one, uh, you know, 75% higher, or 1.7 times what it started out at, uh, but it wasn't three times. And um, and when, when the land share went back, in the first case, uh, their, the uh, $100,000 house went back, to, the $200,000 house went back to $100,000. The land value evaporated uh, largely. And then in the case of the more expensive house, we found that the land value was much more stable because, as Heard teaches us, it was much more based on an actual utility, original utility or a change in utility. Um, these are the DC charts from Steve presented uh, for LA yesterday. They show the same picture, and, and the reason I present them is because most people don't realize DC was this boom-bust market. They think of DC as being pretty flat. It recovered very quickly in certain areas, and as the map, uh, you know, one of the maps Steve showed yesterday, it was not an even recovery. Um, and this is speculative elements coming into play, and that speculative element is the speculation in land. And it was in the low, the cheap land where it was the greatest, and least in the more expensive land. And then when it reversed, if a new utility does not arise, exchange uh, prices may advance and recede, but intrinsic values did not change. And again, the cheap places started out as cheap land went back to being cheap land because there was not a new utility, as Heard predicted back in 1903. And by the way, Heard had big data back then. He wasn't just thinking about this. He actually was a subsidiary of a, of a title insurance company, and, and it was lawyer's title. And so he had trans hundreds of thousands of transactions in which he could uh, pull the data in and analyze land prices. And, and so he actually had land prices. They calculated it back then on a front foot basis. Uh, it was just the way it was done in 1900. Uh, value depends on nearness, nearness on utility. And again, with the exception of PG County, for the reasons I've explained, uh, you see that the, the really value areas in terms of um, land per square foot, price per square foot, is close in. 
because PG County is so large and had such a devastation, as you see from all of the, the light color, it really makes the outer ring look like it wasn't quite as bad as otherwise was. But the, this thing is really weighted over towards Prince George's County. If you were to eliminate Prince George's County, the outer rings of the rest of the counties would end up looking like they, um, the herd analysis. They still look that way, but it's, it's really um, the imbalance that's uh, provided by a pop, uh, county of almost a million population being Prince George's County. Speculative elements enhance the risk of loss to mortgagees who permit them to creep into valuations of properties upon which they make loans, Babcock and Fisher. And of course, we see very clearly where the big drops in house prices were. And of course, um, we know that that's, of course, where the losses were also because it related to the big drops in prices. Uh, an appraisal should be a guardrail against allowing speculative elements to become uh, prominent, predominant in mortgage lending, and it hasn't been a guardrail. Uh, it's of limited value because it only provides an opinion of the most likely selling price, and everything we learned is that is not enough. Um, the components, um, you need to have a robust evaluation of current market price, not market value, but market price, call it what it is. Uh, you need market cycle history, you need a history of uh, buyers and sellers markets going back long times, you need buying power due to change in leverage, you need land value and change in land shares, and you need whether this real, uh, whether the real price change uh, adjusted for inflation is due to leverage growth or improving utility or a mix. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, to um, the appraisal of the future that you should also have. It was a handout. And uh, I've already covered more or less the, the first page of this uh, in the slide that I just went through. So I'm going to quickly just go through uh, the summary mortgage lending value. And, and this is very much a work in progress. It was, it's really the culmination, as I said yesterday, when we had the first conference, we had this concept of we need to get at the difference between market price and market value, call whatever you want, or market price and intrinsic value, and we didn't quite know how to get there. Um, we've done a lot of research, and, and a lot of people have done a lot of research since, and this is sort of the state of the thinking that I have at, at this juncture. Uh, I decided to pick a you know, home I was very familiar with, um, and I've been asked by a couple of individuals, you know, you need to do another home that's in an area that maybe the, the, the intrinsic value is much lower or substantially lower than the current uh, uh, selling price. So I picked this house, I described the improvements, I, I do things that aren't in the normal description, uh, you know, age, well-maintained, roof replaced, chimney recently repaired, uh, the four, the, the furnace is over 40 years old, but still working, likely near the end of its life. If you've got 20 or 30 percent down, that's no problem. But if you're doing a VA loan on that property, VA, if, if that, I don't know, it wouldn't be eligible. But if you were, VA would probably say to the uh, require the appraiser to to note that, and the VA lender would probably require the repla replacement of that uh, furnace. Why? Because the VA doesn't want this 100 percent. A zero down payment, 100% loan buyer having to replace the furnace in the first three years. Full stop. They don't want that to happen. Um, and uh, as I say, any functional obsolescence may be addressed by remodeling, which given the site utility discussed below would be cost effective. You know, you can, you, you, it's very hard given this location to over uh, improve this particular location because of its utility and nearness. I then go through neighborhood and uh, market information, the boundaries, elements related to utility, including walk score from Zillow. The walk score is very low. The transit score is pretty low. But it's got a drop dead location in terms of auto commute to the major uh, employment centers, including you know, downtown DC. A uh, little bit uh, more difficult to get to Tyson's Corner, but downtown DC is straight down Massachusetts Avenue, very easy. Uh, then uh, moving on to uh, chart one, uh, this gives some information on the number of jobs. That is fundamentally the beginning of any utility of a particular location. How many jobs are there and what's the job growth? And uh, we'll have more on that uh, for the next year's conference uh, from Steve and myself, but this just gives you a, a quick snapshot that says Fairfax County, which is a big competitor for Montgomery, has had five times the job growth 
since uh, 2001 as Montgomery County. And Steve had looked at uh, Chicago and what Chicago had no job growth since when? No net job growth since 2000. Since 2000, that was Chicago Metro, right? Yeah. I mean, these are stunning numbers when you think about it, yet it's all ignored in the process. And it's not fair to low-income buyers to ignore the realities of what's driving the market. It, it isn't a consumer benefit to do that. Um, the next uh, single-family attached housing trends for the neighborhood competitive market area and areas of geography such as county. I just pulled this off of Zillow. This uh, goes back to 2005. It's a 10-year trend. Um, I didn't have time to do a full change to real home prices. I calculated it myself. I looked at the uh, annual rent um, for both the subject property and then the county, excuse me, the Bethesda and the uh, ZIP. Uh, next chart shows the median nominal price for a Montgomery County by Tercile, uh, and then for the zip itself, and the zip is in the upper uh, Tercile of uh, house prices. Uh, and uh, I, I looked at the top Tercile uh, and the, uh, the zip that the subject's in, and you can see the top Tercile has done pretty well. It's, it's basically, you know, the trend line going back to 96 is, it looks pretty good. Um, and then the next chart, uh, and there are a couple numbers that got drop, dropped off, home pricing dispersion among zips. This is a point you know, that we've been talking about. Um, the red item, the red values are missing in the first box on the uh, left. It should be 77%. In the second middle box, it should be negative 13%. And in the right box, it should be plus 11. So 70, plus 77 minus 13 plus 11. And so you see that this particular uh, 2816 had the least uh, trough to peak, had the least drop, and has had tied for the uh, bottom in terms of increase. And these three zips were picked, you know, not randomly other than the subject, uh, to, to de demonstrate that. And one of the questions that was asked is, as I said, is what would a property in one of these other zip codes that doesn't have as favorable uh, utility look like? Um, Buying power changes uh, over the last, that due to leverage. Uh, it's very hard to get this at a zip code level, and we've basically, Steve and I have decided, well, the way to do that, it's kind of the Willie Sutton rule, you know, why do you rob banks? Because that's where they keep the money. Why do you look at FHA? Because that's where they keep the leverage. And our National Mortgage Risk Index shows that, you know, it's a 24 versus Fannie and Freddie are at uh, six or six and a half, and the average is 12. And so if you're looking for leverage in the market today, given the absence of a private subprime market, it's going to be FHA. And so we just track, uh, uh, this was a combination of Humda data and CoreLogic data, um, that we just track the incidence of FHA. So there's not much leverage going on in this market. I mean, we can fine tune this, but this was a quick way of doing it. Uh, the next is out of our land uh, value uh, and change in land value uh, uh, share. Uh, and we show that the uh, land price uh, uh, for um, the land share is pretty stable. It's gone up a little bit, but it didn't, it didn't crater. Again, that's evidence of the utility. Uh, the lot value, you know, went up a fair amount. Uh, it came down some. It's recovered mostly. Um, but again, compared to other areas, uh, this looks pretty benign. Um, the next is most likely uh, market price using sales comparison approach. I started with Zillow. They have a statistical way of doing this. You could start with virtually any AVM that's sort of statistically proven. But Zillow's, Zillow's on the website free. And I just started with that data. Um, and got the subject property and a bunch of comps. I then said, okay, I'm going to start with that. Now let me prove whether Zillow is right or not and, and whether I can tighten up that range. And so Zillow came up with, I think, a $980,000 or whatever uh, based on the other chart uh, earlier. And I basically found three comps. There were only three that I could use. I didn't have access to MLS and stuff, so I, again, I had to be limited by what I could find on the, the web quickly. Um, and so the three is just a, 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 a fact. I mean, it wasn't. But I didn't exclude any, and I didn't start with the sales price. I said, I want to find every comp there is out there that's appropriate, and I, want, I don't want to use the sales price of the subject, which, of course, is made up, of the subject to try to uh, back into that. And we'll hear more about that in a little while. And so I went through that, and then the map shows these are very close comparables. I mean, these are a stone's throw from the subject. Uh, and then I concluded. Uh, a much tighter range than what Zillow had, 
Um, and then I concluded a market price based on the other analysis uh, and an intrinsic value and then a mortgage lending value. So um, that's, um, that's the approach uh, that I took. Uh, any comments uh, would be greatly appreciated. As I said this is very much a work in progress. I just finished this, you know, as a as a, an example just in the last day or two in anticipation of, of today's presentation. But it's really the culmination of, you know, three or four years of research into this, including attending the mortgage lending value course. Uh, thanks to um, Andreas and Reiner uh, in Berlin a year and a half ago. So. Uh, I think we're out of time. What was the time schedule in my band? I think I, yeah. Okay. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'll be here. Thank you. Is everybody ready? Cool. Um, I'm really, oh, just for those of you who don't know me, I am Penny Reed from Wells Fargo. Um, and I lurk around in the background all the time. Although I can never help myself, I have to ask questions. So I will be probably asking questions of the, using my moderator prerogative after everybody does that. But I <coughs> promise everyone I will not ask about fantasy football. Um, Wow, that was a fun debate last night. But anyway, <laughs> um, this next panel is a subject near and dear to my heart, and it uh, basically is talking about collateral valuation in uh, the state we are in today, and, and as Ed pointed out, probably where we need to go in the future. I had um, rapidly over time, I guess not rapidly, but over time come to the conclusion, same one Ed has and some others, that what we measure today to determine collateral risk is not where the collateral risk is. And we are measuring a lot of things, we're capturing a lot of data, but I don't necessarily think it's the right data and that it's not serving us from a risk management standpoint, it's not serving the consumers, and therefore, we need to change. So we have a very uh, distinguished panel here, and I'll uh, go ahead and uh, introduce them in the order they're going to speak and just do a brief part of their bios. You'll have the full bios, and, and most of them are probably good without introduction, but you'll have their full bios in your sheet. Um, at first will be Yanling Meyer, who's Director of Research at FNC and is responsible for the development and execution of housing research and analysis initiatives, as well as um, collateral-focused data and analytics product development, so looking at new things like that. After that, we have Joan. <laughs> Joan Trice is the founder and CEO of Altera Group, which is the parent company of, uh, uh, or founder of a lot of the other things you may have heard of, the Collateral Risk Network, who is one of the co-sponsors of this meeting, the Appraisal Buzz Valuation Expo, and Clearbox, which uh, is a company that attempts to um, shore up some of the shortcomings we have in our regulatory tracking system, licensing and, and tracking of appraisers. And then the final speaker will be Ed DeMarco, who of course everyone here now knows. Um, so I can go short on that one and go ahead and kick it off. Do you want to start? And I also want to thank Ed for um, inviting me to be on this panel. Um, 
what I would like to bring up for, um, it, well, again, I, it's great to be here. And by that, I really mean it. Um, because if nothing else, um, there's one thing I know um, is a great take home when I travel back to the state of Mississippi, which is um, in the chart from an early presenter, Mr. Cox. Um, well, everyone knows, you know, state of Mississippi, we are the poorest of the poor. Um, but um, even though I haven't had a chance to look at the other reference points, but based on comparison relative to the state of California, we are not that far behind the, the one of the richest state in the country. Um, so for my part on the panel, um, I would like to bring up four observations and discussions of systematic uh, behaviors, which if you would call it to risk. Um, underneath um, appraisal development process. Um, that is, I want to bring some visibility to what's really going on underneath that process um, so that we could gain a better understanding of um, appraisal valuation in its current form and substance, and particularly in light of some of the ongoing dialogues and efforts towards building a more independent and effective appraisal process for the housing finance system. It was great to hear that yesterday our um, distinguished keynote speaker, Mr. DeMarco, talked about a part of having this um, market-based solution to managing housing risk is to ensure accurate, transparent, and um, confident, uh, confidence on the appraisal data. So with that said, oh, I must make a statement as well, um, because our corpor um, corporate uh, FNC's general counsel, um, Neil, is in the audience. So I must say, um, the comments and uh, views here <laughs> is my own, um, not in any way represent those of FNCs. So with that said, um, well, speaking of, speaking of um, inflated appraisals, um, I'm sure to many of us this is a quite familiar picture um, that shows unmistakably upward appraisal bias whereby you're looking at 90% um, of the appraisals are at or above the market price. It, it has a, 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 a breakdown of 30% um, pretty much identical to the market price and the other 60%, more than 60% actually, um, above the market price. And uh, well, if, uh, should you ask, um, only purchased loan appraisals are captured in this data. And if we move on to this second picture, which you may or may not already know, only reinforces the fact that the persistency in appraising at or above the market price is not really a function of um, prevailing market conditions. These are the same distribution data, but broken down by year from 2010 um, to 2014. A time period, if you would recall, the US housing market dipped back into recession midway through 2010, but eventually began to recover in early 2012. And throughout, um, Again, higher appraisals consistently hover around 60% and identical to contract ones, 30%. The remaining 10% um, are lower appraisals. So regardless of market conditions, um, we can pretty much trust that 9 in 10 appraisals are what we call good appraisals. Um, but, um, well, I could be wrong, but I'm going to guess that you had likely been informed during the recession otherwise about the prevalence of the low appraisals. I knew I was. Um, well, these are some real headline news that had caught my attention at the time. 
they were all front page um, news on the Wall Street Journal. I'm sorry uh, uh, for the incomplete reference here. Um, you know, blaming low appraisals for derailing the housing recovery. Um, judgment call, appraisal waste on housing sales. Fighting back against low ball appraisal when appraisal has a tanks a home sale. Well, with headline news like this, um, you'd be given the impression that the problems of low appraisals were on a much larger scale. But the matter of the fact is, um, despite challenges of distressed sales, nine out of 10 appraisals continue to support the market price. Well, I, I'm happy to, 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 to let you know that, um, you know, with, with anecdotes, stories like this, but not everyone actually bought into it. Um, at that time, there was one refreshing voice that uh, I found particularly welcoming, as well as funny in the meantime. Um, it came from one of our very own hosts, Ed Pinto here, in a commentary he wrote, um, responding to misleading industry data on low appraisals. So if I may. What low appraisals? You got to be joking. Um, I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> Well, the data earlier, you've seen that there's really, um, that second picture, that there's really no bearing of market conditions on um, the persistence to systematic appraisal bias. But what does seem to have a bearing on the bias is leverage. On this picture, um, the percentage of appraisals exceeding the market price by at least 1% is tabulated separately for loans with different leverage. It is obvious that there seem to be a positive correlation between leverage and um, the tendency to, uh, the, to appraise much higher at the market price. So you are looking at for loans with LTV, at 75 or below, 37% of the appraisals are at or above at least 1% of the market price, up to 47% for loans with LTV at 95 or higher. Well, to those of you who um, may believe that um, this systematic appraisal overvaluation is driven more fundamentally by institutional factors, which um, as um, academics would refer to it as agency problem. Um, I'm sure this picture also seemed to make um, a bit of sense to you. Well, before moving on to this, um, sh the results, before moving on to show you the results from this uh, rather some detailed um, or microscopic examination of the appraisal development process, I want to just say a few words on the, the appraisal method behind the data you see here and of course invariably um, elsewhere. The sales comparison approach, um, which is based on the principle of substitution, as you, if you would recall, has become the gold standard on um, appraising single family homes since 2005. And given all the data limitations and uh, problems, um, and then when you're factoring in institutional or human factors, it is not surprising that we often hear criticisms such as data mining and adjustments being highly subjective, um, arbitrary, inconsistent, et cetera, et cetera. And it is often um, criticized as well for um, being unscientific because it's, it's largely ba rely based on 
a limited field subjective comparable data observations. Now, this may sound a bit trivial um, to say it, but if you look at the approach, there's really nothing under the approach that suggests we should necessarily favor um, certain type of comparables. It doesn't say better comparables are more favorable to lower priced compar comparables. But only that um, the best comps are the ones most similar to the subject property in terms of all the physical and economic characteristics, as abstract as that might sound. Um, but in practice, did I? Okay. But in practice, we are looking at two out of three properties used to develop appraisal value or higher priced recent sales. And if you look at the average price difference, these two thirds higher comps have a market price averaging 12% higher than the subject, compared to the other one third averaging 7% below the subject. Well, granted, these numbers in themselves do not, um, they are not necessarily problematic. Um, but what does appear to be wrong, if you look at this picture, is that there's a lack of meaningful reduction in either the average price difference or the price dispersion. The numbers in parentheses um, are the standard deviation measure of the price dispersion of um, the percentage price difference between comp and subject prices. Now, this is quite surprising, actually, because um, the intuition is, well, as we adjust the comparable properties to enhance or reduce the att their attributes to reflect those of the subject property, we would expect the comp's price to become more comparatively aligned with the subject price. But th the fact of there's a really no meaningful reduction in either of these two metrics um, that says something. Um, well, maybe these numbers would provide some explanation. What we are looking at here is that um, we are looking at nearly 30% I apologize, that would be nearly 40% of higher priced comps um, are adjusted even further up. And close to 30% of the lower comps are adjusted further down. Even when you focus only on those with a substantial price difference with the subject, so that there's less uncertainty or ambiguity, if you will, regarding this comp's relative superiority or inferiority. We continue to see a sizable portion, 30% for higher priced, um, 20, a bit more than 20% for lower priced comps. They continue to receive in the adjustment that's in a direction that seems to contradict intuition. With this, we, I think we, sh we ought to ask the question, um, what caused it? Is it because of frequent use of um, properties that are not true comparable? Or mm -hmm. is it because of um, frequently false adjustments? Or both? Next, and this is uh, the last piece of data I want to uh, bring up um, for discussion today. These are the net adjustments, net price adjustment on the comparable properties. And they are computed separately for lower and higher comps, which are further divided up based on the price difference with the subject property. The price difference is used to uh, 
approximate potentially underlying characteristic differences. The ones stacked on top, the orange bars, these are the average net adjustment for low accounts. And the ones um, in blue are the net adjustments for high accounts. A couple of takeaway. Well, the contrast um, is, is, is quite uh, big here. If you compare to the average adjustment to the lower comps, what you see on higher comps is a pattern that the adjustments are uniformly much smaller across all price tiers. And a second interesting um, pattern here is a pattern in which um, the adjustments on higher comps do not seem to respond much at all to potentially widening characteristic differences. You have about a minute and a half left. Or All right, thank <laughs> you. Um, this, just the same pattern on the gross adjustments, and oh. then this, and the next slide. This, uh, these two slides are just the reproduction of the same net and gross adjustments data, but um, displayed on the continuous uh, comparable price spectrum, just a different view of this adjustment disparity. Um, these are s uh, uh, the, n the number of the fundings we've uh, 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 talked about uh, earlier, so I'm going to skip that with the time constraint. Um, well, in all fairness, um, the appraisal process is not perfect science um, and inevitably prone to error. And particularly when um, good comps are lacking, which would increase um, the probability of making bad choices on market data selection as well as uh, adjustments. And with all the data limitations and the problems, um, I would imagine we are all be more than willing to give the process quite um, considerable leeway. But, but before we find ourselves trying to explain everything away with data limitations, maybe we should also think about structural limitations. Um, for instance, the proliferation of AMCs following the housing bust under HVCC and the Dodd-Frank. Well, is it merely a form um, on appearance, or is it a true institutional innovation? Um, the AMCs gained popularity and worked at the time. Um, it was necessary, and it was probably a good thing. Um, but reflecting on it, um, it's, it, it also seems legitimate to ask the question that uh, given the fact that we are seeing some uh, shift away, toward, um, uh, away from AMC and towards panel of fee appraisers, um, we ought to ask a question about uh, its purported solution as um, to appraisal independence. And I personally believe that the sales comparison approach is a good valuation technique and with the uh, um, with the availability um, of today's um, predict analytics and data sources, um, it, it's going to, it has a great potential to become a, a, a scientific approach, and uh, which would mean that it could di uh, re re diminish the biases and the various irregularities that silently make their way into the data. Thank you. Thank you, Yanling. That um, segues nicely into what I'm going to talk about. There's been a whole lot written on the mortgage crisis, and um, some of them are really good books. Some of them, you know, even the not so great books, you still learn something from, you know, maybe to the uh, to Ed Pinto's uh, Whopper meter, um, you know, how could you possibly think that? And there's a lot of uh, revisionist history um, already happening, but 
I, I think the, the most interesting thing is we really can't even do a post-mortem because we don't have the data. And I think that's uh, been a resounding theme throughout the, the conference. Um, we have a lot of we have a lot of data, and and it's it's even a little frightening when we talk about big data, uh, because I think the quality of the data, and as Penny's point earlier, just even collecting the right data points uh, is just a critical place to start. Um, but in all of the books, uh, some of them do, but very few of them actually address uh, the, the failures of the appraisal process. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about that. And hopefully, um, you know, you won't walk away just being horribly depressed. I, we were talking earlier about optimism versus pessimism. Um, in spite of all the horrible things I'm going to scare you with here in the beginning, Hopefully, we'll end the uh, discussion with possible solutions, and then how do we actually um, make those happen? Uh, Ed Pinto, uh, years ago, pointed me to Josh Rosner's um, paper written in 2001, and I think it's just astounding because he absolutely nailed it, and he said, I mean, you, I don't know if you all can read it, but the, the appraisal and the appraised value of the home is arguably the most important element of the home loan origination process. Now, I'm an appraiser, so it's easy for me to say, no, duh. But we still are focused, and if you read a lot of the regula regulations and, and a lot of the policy, it's credit, credit, credit. Well, these are collateralized loans. And so we really, you know, the one of the C's is collateral. So we really value is an important input. Again, he said changes to the appraisal process over the past decade have jeopardized the soundness of the process and skewed real estate prices. So again, what we spoke about yesterday and a little bit today was the collateral valuation process is actually very important, not only to the investors, the macro level, but also down at the home buying level. I, we're putting uh, the riskiest borrowers in the riskiest properties and setting them up for failure when we overvalue property. So having that value right is, is important. And then Alan Greenspan said, this is astounding, even though some down payments are borrowed, it would take a large and historically most unusual fall in home prices to wipe out a significant part of home equity. No comment. <laughs> I want... A Yangling brought this up, and, and this is glossed over uh, quite a bit, and I'm going to make my friend uh, Ed DeMarco a little uncomfortable here. But um, this, from an appraiser's perspective, was a huge historical event. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people who didn't appreciate uh, the New York Attorney General's office's approach approach to how they handled a, the appraisal independence problem, but it did get everybody's attention. Uh, what concerns me a little bit today is that we pretended we fixed it with the Home Valuation Code of Conduct, and I'm going to respectfully submit that we have not, and it's a huge risk factor. We still aren't getting credible appraisals, as Yanling pointed out and that we need to fix. And a recent comment from Merrill Lynch, economist, all those things we did in the past, we're not doing anymore, and we're not leveraged, so we're okay. So hopefully, uh, now you all feel optimistic about the housing <laughs> market. Who can we blame? Now, you know, this is kind of 
I know we all participate in the blame game. Uh, I'm not doing this just to, to be a bully and beat people up, but I think going forward, we need to assess the role of each one of these stakeholders so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. I submit that had the stakeholders all done their part, the bubble would at least have been moderated. Who deserves the most blame? Now, I, I'm speaking for, with my praiser hat on when I say this. I, I think Fannie and Freddie do. And, and I say that because they entirely control the appraisal process. Some might say, well, the subcommittee has some power or the appraisal foundation has some power. Uh, that's not true. An appraiser can't wind their watch without a Fannie Mae form. I mean, that is what they do. And so uh, we really need to be thinking about this because if Fannie and Freddie weren't here tomorrow, although that doesn't appear to be any immediate risk, um, we need to have a system in place to be able to move forward. So what's the path to, the path to a solution? If we truly want to ensure the safety and soundness of the housing finance system, an independent valuation entity needs to be established. It needs to be independent of Fannie and Freddie, independent of VA, independent of FHA. Let's talk a little bit about the, the P's, the policy, the practice, the procedure, and the people. Uh, those are all components that play a role. Uh, we have had in the past misaligned incentives. We've had a lack of independence, and we still do uh, opaqueness. Uh, prior to the mortgage crisis, I'm not even sure this is a generally known fact, but Fannie and Freddie did not get a copy of the appraisal at all. It was completely reliant on reps and warrants. And I remember being an appraiser when I learned that. And I don't remember exactly the date, but I remember thinking, well, that just can't be. And, and I was told that uh, the only time that they get a copy of the appraisal when it's in default, and then they, of course, look at it after the fact. GSE policy today, Ed's talked about the devolution of the appraisal process, and hopefully people are listening. There are actually, uh, unbeknownst to many, there are three approaches to value, and we have gone down to today to just a single approach to value, which I would re respectfully submit we're not even doing correctly. Uh, part of that is the form process, but if all you're asking appraisers for is to report a sale price, sale price and market value are not synonymous, and boy, do we really uh, fall into that trap because I, I sit in meetings with policymakers who think, well, the definition of market value is just what a buyer's willing to pay and a uh, seller's willing to sell. And that's just one piece of that definition. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, there's no accountability. There's all, virtually little risk analysis product, again, just the form issues. Uh, process, market value definition is flawed. And then just appraisers are asked to do some really dumb things, and I don't even blame the appraiser, but we give the appraiser the answer to the problem before they start. We insist on giving them the contract price and asking honest people to pretend that they're not going to be influenced by the answer. And enough studies have been done about anchoring, and, and even if you're an honest person, you're still influenced. The people, 
we don't do a very good job of doing due diligence on the actual qualifications of the people performing the appraisals. Fannie and Freddie now have a system where they are placing, now that they're looking at appraisal data through uh, UCDP, they are creating exclusionary lists, if you will. Uh, Fannie Mae only has six people on their list. Now, do you really think there's only six bad appraisers in the United States? Do you think there are more than six appraisers identified by their fraud department? So the fraud department isn't even communicating to the the front end of the system. And I think I'm kind of pressed for time here. So um, I'm going to talk about risk buckets because I think this is where we need to go. Um, so if you looked at just there's property risk, um, there's the age of the property, the components, uh, the conformity to the neighborhood. I mean, examples of that are is if you have a geodesic dome in a in a homo otherwise homogeneous neighborhood, there's nowhere today do we accommodate the fact that that property would be um, not a good property for a bank to have to to take back. The market conditions. Uh, again, appraisers aren't asked for these things, but some of these things, you don't have to be sophisticated to report on these things. Some of these just can be pulled in through simple um, uh, third-party databases, you know, unemployment rate. The appraiser doesn't need to know that. But they do know days on market. Uh, they should be able to see the velocity of change, you know, in using Las Vegas as an example, because that's an easy one. If all the appraiser is asked to do is report recent sale prices, and recent sale prices are going up, you know, at 10% a month, nobody actually asks them if that's sustainable. It's, it's not asked of the appraiser. It's, it's absurd. All of these other things, of course, to um, affect property values. Environmental, there are always uh, external influences. Anybody who, uh, uh, any lender in the audience who may have held some properties with uh, Chinese, mold, uh, Chinese drywall or mold uh, would understand these things. Uh, external influences. Transportation, we talked about walkability indexes yesterday, uh, access to public transportation, access to water in certain areas in the West. Uh, there's other, both positive and negative external influence. You're down to about a minute. All right. In the famous words of Britney Spears, <laughs> oops, I did it again. I talked about this earlier. Uh, I'm concerned because we haven't fixed the independence problem that we could have HVCC squared. And if everybody thought that was embarrassing um, the first time around, um, not only is it going to be embarrassing, it's going to be painful if we haven't recovered from the last one when we get hit with the second one. Customary and reasonable fees are an issue. It is the law of the land. And unfortunately, we still have misaligned incentives for folks to engage the cheapest appraiser. Third party risk. Yanling talked a little bit about appraisal management companies. And it is, uh, I think. I think it was earlier today we talked about how every, everything is again moving back to the shadow banking system. Uh, I would submit that this is where the appraisal independence problems are happening, that mortgage brokers are indeed influencing the, um, the appraisal process.
Okay. Uh, what do we need to do? We need an infrastructure overhaul. We need to build a real estate superhighway. We need to establish an appraisal repository accessible to all stakeholders. Establish an op open market exchanges for mortgage-backed securities and create an independent agency or an appraisal czar. All right, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to pinch hit on this panel. A uh, pleasure to be here. Um, and sort of wrapping up uh, as we get near not just the end of the panel but the conference gives me an opportunity to, um, you know, uh, reflect on uh, some of the uh, issues and points that have been made um, over the course of the past uh, day and a half. It also gives me a chance to extend on my own comments from yesterday. So let me uh, briefly tie together a few observations. Some of them have been covered before. A couple things that, uh, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm, I don't recall having been, been talked about. Um, so this panel is about really the, you know, the, the content of the appraisal and what's going on in the appraisal. So as Penny said in introducing us, what's, what's the whole point of this? The, the point of this Right, is risk management. Right? The point of having an appraisal is to allow this credit market to function in a way in which there's prudential management of risk. And so where are we in that, and where does the appraisal need to go or be rethought of or developed or enhanced to enhance our own um, understanding of risk? So let me take an example that's going to build on something Yenling said. So, um, it's the danger of false precision. When is a 97% LTV mortgage a 97% LTV mortgage? Well, if you look at the data that um, you know, Yenling had from the appraisals, you'd say, well, it's at least 50%. All right, I'll submit that in round numbers, the answer is approximately zero, all right? Um, why? Well, look, I mean, it's an opinion of value. It is subject to a host of measurement errors. There's things about the home condition, the whole list of things that, that Joan had up there just a minute ago that can affect that. There's concessions that are going on. There's price momentum in the marketplace. Well, okay, all right, yeah, all right, so we're off a little bit. How much does that matter? All right, when is a borrower underwater? Well, borrower, assuming we are measuring value, right, the borrower is underwater as long as their loan to value is above 93 or 94 percent. And that's assuming we've got value properly stated. Why is that? Because if tomorrow something happens as a life event, the borrower needs to sell the house, that's the cost of exit. So we got, you know, a lot of underwater borrowers out there just because of, 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 of that um, observation. Now, um, yesterday, you, you may recall, just if I could briefly reflect on my own remarks, about creating a trading credit m market in, in mortgage credit risk. And I talked about um, the data developments, and I mentioned the development of the Uniform Appraisal Data Set and the Uniform Collateral Data Portal. But I noted there, well, this is good in that we've got an infrastructure. But let me just be clear. When UAD was created, when that data set was created, it was little more than taking the Fannie Mae form that Joan mentioned and saying, okay, well, let's, let's make sure between Fannie and Freddie we've got consistent definitions and that we've, you know, electronify this. But it wasn't actually any meaningful attempt to consider, are we asking the right questions? Are we collecting the right data? Right? And where is this going? So now let me take another thing from my remarks. If, if what we're trying to do is to extend mortgage credit risk so that this is an actual credit market in which there is trading and participation by a wide host of private investors, the question about the appraisal then ought to be, well, at some level, that investor is, a, is either a customer or the customer for the appraisal because the appraisal's purpose is risk management. We got a trading credit market. The investment community is the one managing that credit. So what do they need out of the appraisal? Well, maybe we ought to ask them, okay? So this conference has been terrific. I mean, I just, I've, I've learned a lot here. And, and one of the things that we've all sort of um, uh, been part of the last day and a half is this array of housing risk measures 
what they are, how they might be used, how we might be thinking about them, okay? So the particular question we're asking in the context of the appraisal then is how can we recast the appraisal, what it is that we're collecting, right? And how do we make that information public? That is available to investors, available to analysts like you all, think tankers and academics and so on, so that we can study and debate housing market conditions and risk, right? So let me just give, uh, there's a lot, I mean, I'm not going to go on here. Let me just give a couple examples of data that could enhance the risk assessment. And I'm really, so, so one is, should we supplement or replace this notion of a single opinion of value with some kind of, of range or confidence interval or some measure of distribution around that value opinion? Is there some way we can extract from the appraiser some measure of the confidence or the certainty or uncertainty they have with regard to the opinion of value? And the second is, this appraiser, right? These are not j these are boots and eyes on the ground, on the property, on the neighborhood that ought to have real local information. What is the value proposition the appraiser has to that capital market investor that the investor can't get from our otherwise big data world? So where's the value proposition? What can that appraiser put in an appraisal report that can get transmitted to investors in mortgage credit that helps the investor have greater confidence about collateral value or the uncertainty or risk around collateral value? What can the appraiser tell about, we've had several discussions, including Jack Horton, about walkability or nearness, as, as Ed calls it transportation costs, energy efficiency, the condition of the property, the employment circumstances in the neighborhood. I'll submit another one that I think is going to become an emergent issue, and that is local municipal finance. Right? What's going to happen to house values is some of our uh, communities realize that they have pension obligations that are through the roof, and what the long-term tax implications of that's going to be and how that's going to affect um, uh, uh, house values. Okay, so there's some interesting things that ought to be thought through here. I think we have an opportunity that is part of creating a trading credit market. We ought to be connecting folks that are creating housing risk measures like you all, investors who are now going to have to price and manage this risk and are going to want to know about their collateral risk, and appraisers and ask the question, what is it that appraiser can produce that has value. Let me quickly touch on a couple other things. So Joan concluded with the notion about building a, a mortgage infrastructure. There was a discussion earlier uh, in this morning's panel about um, having an, an inventory of property ar around the United States. I agree with all that. I'd extend it and say, okay, well, where's the public database about appraisals and what are we going to do with this, with this property inventory that can help us with some of our title issues? Let me close with, um, with three other thoughts. Um, the first is, by trying to raise these points for consideration, I want to be clear, I'm not trying to turn the appraiser into a social scientist. The objective of the appraiser is not to be running complex algorithms. The point of the appraiser is that it's a trained individual that can go in and gather information and record it in a manner in which social scientists and risk managers can then make better informed judgments and decisions. The second, uh, my, in my concluding point, something that I don't, I don't recall having been discussed, but boy, this is going to need some thought. What are we going to do with concessions in a home sale? What do we do when the house price has been grossed up and then there's some kind of cost being paid by the seller on behalf of the, of the buyer? And how are we going to have clarity that to the extent this is going on, that this is being properly recorded in a manner in which an appraiser that's using that sales transaction subsequently as a comparable 
has clarity about that? How do we know that the investor has clarity about value when there are when there are concessions or other things going on in the financing and the closing of this property? And what does that mean for risk? Right. So that's a really important issue that I think needs to be really deserves some some attention. And then finally, with regard to the regulation, the appraisal um, uh, industry, um, you know what we're talking about here. Several people have said it is we're we're talking about a national market in in housing credit. Right? And right now we've got this really kind of odd um, oversight structure at the federal level and at the state level. The federal level one was created in 1989 at a time in which the bulk of mortgage credit risk was actually being managed uh, by uh, insured depository institutions. So we said, okay, well, let's get all the insured depository institution regulators together. We'll create this appraisal subcommittee and have them start regulating. Well, almost as soon as we did that, we started moving all this mortgage credit risk away from insured depositories and onto GSEs and other, other types of balance sheets. I also suggest that really we need one. Um, you know, federal overseer, and I think that down this food chain of other entities involved in appraisal standard setting and oversight um, is something uh, really in need of, um, of some uh, careful thought and overhaul. So I will just, I'll tease it there and leave it, and we can turn it over to you, Penny. All right, um, I, I actually am gonna ask, oops. I am gonna ask a couple of questions. Um, and, and one, just back to you to, as a clarification, Ed, is it, it seems to me that the part of what we've gravitated to with today's appraisal, so the 1004, is that we're trying to provide the investor with some assurance that should they need that asset to support a future catastrophic event, that we've accurately predicted based on today what that thing's going to be worth when they default three years from now. So it's like we're trying to predict something we can't necessarily predict, and we're placing all the emphasis on that, on what is the value of that asset versus what the real value should be is, what about that property, that neighborhood, is going to enhance that consumer's ability to stay in that property without defaulting, right? So what is the nearness of employment? What I mean, is do you see it that way? Um. No, I'm not sure I, I quite do. So let me, maybe I'm going to say what you said, but in a different way, or maybe I'm about to disagree with you. I'm not entirely, okay. not entirely sure. Um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's the lender's responsibility in the underwriting process to be able to make, you know, an appropriate judgment about the, abil the borrower's ability to repay. What, what I'm focused on with regard to the appraisal isn't can the appraiser tell me something about what this property is going to be worth in three years. I don't think the appraiser is trying to predict anything that way. I'm, I'm not th right. sure what you're suggesting. But, but really, um, if you it, what, what I'm trying to get at is that the appraiser is trying to provide – some information that conveys some mix of the confidence the appraiser has around the opinion of value and some measure of the sustainability of that value or what is the, you know, the variance around that, around that value. Those aren't, aren't exactly the same concepts, but the sustainability, I mean, think about Jack Horton sitting here yesterday talking about these bulletproof markets, right? I mean, he's got a set of metrics that he has developed and, and thinks about that indicate that value, if, if the property is located in a community that has the following set of characteristics, there's low volatility around value. Whereas if the property is located in a neighborhood that has a different set of characteristics, there could be much greater you know, variability around value. That tells you something about the sustainability of the of the purchase price in some in right. some future sense. And what I'm trying to say is, okay, well, if the analyst community, as the investor community can develop, you know, some sense of what are those characteristics and how can we objectif 
ob objectively measure them or create ordinal measures for them that can then go into housing risk models right. that it can tell something about not just okay well this is this is the the value or the range of value but it tells us something about the sustainability of that value and i think that then goes to being able to enhance risk management I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah, because part of my thought always is that because it's in the back of uh, it's in the back of my mind right now that at the level of gas prices today is is very similar to what it was before things all went south, and a lot of the early defaults occurred when gas prices increased and borrowers started paying their gas credit cards and not their mortgage, um, and and that was part of it. Well, we face that again if people are still focused on buying houses where there's this tremendous commute or where employment centers are so far away, and it seems like part of the value somehow could be quantified in the appraisal is to talk about how that the sustainability of that property to a normal borrower, a normal consumer. Yeah, no, that's right. So, so proximity to workplace or expected, you know, transit, not just for that particular family, but from that community to where work centers are, ought to be a, an important risk indicator. Yeah, it should be part of the information set. All right, and I think if uh, the two of you have any comments you want to add before we do the Q and A. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, one for Joan. Uh, could you, as an appraiser, would you weigh in on the value of collateral underwriter? and how that is impacting your business? And secondly, for Ed, uh, um, how do we wrestle the uh, uh, the data clearinghouse from Fannie and Freddie so that there is an independent uh, repository for all this information? Tom, I'm not a, a field appraiser today, but I listen to lenders and, and uh, appraisers. Uh, it's a difficult question with a difficult answer. Fannie and Freddie should be looking at the data. I mean, that, that's, I think that's a given. That's a good thing. Um, the challenges with collateral underwriter are you're expecting an appraiser to respond to peer data, but I would respectfully submit I would not trust my peers. So uh, let me give you an example of that. that, that I think the, the biggest weakness in uh, UCDP is that there's no method to, for uh, the integrity of the data. Uh, I'm sure that that's, I hope that's where they're going to go. But so let, let me just use a, a gross example. So if I'm a fraudster, I'm going to submit three bad comps or and they go into the, the data pool. And if you'll forgive my uh, analogy, but everybody's peeing in the same swimming pool. So if, um, if the MLS data is wrong, but I'm the appraiser and I, maybe I've been in that house and I measured it and I know that the size of the house is 2,000 square feet. MLS says it's 2,400 square feet and every appraiser is using MLS data, and that's their input. So 99% of the data inputs say that I'm wrong, but I'm being measured and graded against that bad data. So they've got to find a way to verify the integrity of the data. It's the old garbage in, garbage out. Um, so just uh, I'll make one quick comment, Tom, about collateral underwriting. One thing it does, and this gets a little bit to Joan's point, is certainly create an opportunity to um, flesh out um, 
misrepresentation by appraisers with regard to comps, because now we had a capacity to say, gee, the same property has been used as a comparable in 10 appraisers, appraisals, and in all 10 appraisals, this property is given a different value, different number of bedrooms, different number of bathrooms. It's you know near a highway. It's not near a highway. You'd be amazed. It was really quite something when we first started getting this stuff. So this gets to Joan's point. With regard to um, how we're going to you know create a clearinghouse for this, um, you know, it's an uh, interesting question. I actually think that, you know, the transparency here, you know, making this information available not only would improve appraisals and help investors better manage credit risk, I think it would have a real benefit to home buyers because it would make information about properties in the neighborhoods they're shopping that much more accessible. Um, to be able to judge better for themselves what uh, what a, a, a house you know might be worth in in neighborhood that they're that they're shopping, um, you know look I mean does this get mandated does it do, do you create a market utility is the basis for this look we've already created the um, UCDP as a portal for this information to come in so in some sense we've already started the collection the question now is the the grounds in which to put it out there. One way to do it is to say, look, well, if this if this appraisal is supporting a mortgage and that mortgage is being supported directly or indirectly by the American taxpayer, then we want to see those appraisals made public. That's a place to start. Then I think you'd find the private market would start looking at this and saying, boy, we, uh, we, we could see some real benefit being part of that as well. But if a mortgage is going to be guaranteed by the American taxpayer, then why shouldn't the appraisal be public? I have a few comments to that question um, regarding Fannie's uh, collateral underwriter. Well, before Fannie's collateral underwriter in the private sector, um, a lot of mortgage technology companies such as FNC, we've been um, providing lenders with this uh, appraisal review due diligence tool for many years. Um, it has thousands of rules um, scanning for risk, validating data accuracy, integrity, um, so scanning for risk, compliance, and uh, all that rules. Um, well, you know, let's be honest, it's a model-based, CU is a model-based um, tool. So it, of course it has its limitations, um, but uh, it's a great step in the right direction. Um, and if I can add just one comment, the, the one thing I've heard you sort of read out in, in the, the blogosphere too is just some frustration on, you know, appraisers in general and lenders are afraid to get flagged for something. Um, and so you end up with a lot of unwritten rules. So the guidelines may say it's fine if your net adjustments exceed 15% and your gross adjustments, as long as you explain it. Well, that, that's what it says. But I, I would hazard a guess that appraisers try and find any way to find comps that are not going to exceed those adjustments because they don't want to hit that flag. They don't want to spend another four hours working on an explanation or get 20 phone calls back and forth. So in some ways, the, the data, the collection of data and how you manage it can create unwritten rules that we're going to have to be careful about moving forward in sort of a database environment. This is for Joan. When I was a kid, I always told people I wanted to be an appraisal czar when I grew up. What's your appraisal czar and your independent agency? I mean, we got the foundation, we got the institute, we got a bunch of what I think is independent. I'm not understanding what is still needed to help solve this problem. Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, thank you, George. Um, in, yeah. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, I'm out of time. Um, we are almost out. All right. In in my world, their uh, fireia would be unwound, and we'd start over. And uh, instead of appraisal falling under FIFIAC regulators, I mean, you've got oversight from Fannie and Freddie, so to speak. You've got Found, I mean, I, I would just start over with a with a blank slate. So I think it needs to be thought out from the big macro global view of how do you get a mortgage a national mortgage structure 
that makes sense and without having 50 state borders <laughs> to uh, to cross and and then the valuation piece is just a component under that bigger housing finance structure. So it does look like we are out of time, um, but I'm gonna make just one more comment just because I'm gonna exercise my privilege. And that is um, one thing to think about moving forward with a regulatory system that is, it's kind of a big frustration today in that the only actual proactive management of appraiser quality is done by lenders and AMCs. When you, when you look at the regulatory system today and the state regulating, it's all reactive. Somebody complains, somebody files a complaint, somebody turns them in, a loan goes into default and somebody finally reviews the appraisal. It's all reactive on that point and we need to find a way to fix that somehow. That you know, the states aren't funded to do it. So how do we fix that problem? And with that, thank you all very much. So uh, we're going to break uh, for lunch uh, in the foyer, and then come back in here, and then we'll have a uh, closing panel discussion. Uh, Joan, Steve, and myself. Um, so please uh, go out and uh, get your lunch. Thank you.
We're going to get started um, with the uh, final uh, wrap-up discussion of the uh, fourth annual uh, Housing Risk Confer International Housing Risk Conference, and um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Joan, otherwise known as the Queen. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I'll, I'll be really brief. Uh, this has been, I'm going to pat you on the back and we can, uh, we can have a group hug later, Steve. Um, I, I think the conversations were fantastic and it has inspired thought. So uh, when we began the conference, I said, I hope we can take these, these things away and um, create an action plan around it. So uh, that's going to take um, some response from you all, too. So if there's any particular thing that you would like to see done or would like to participate, contact us, and we would love to, um, to move this forward. Great. Um, thanks, Joan. And let me just thank Joan and Ed for all of the work that went into um, making this conference reality. I think it did turn out very well. The conversations were great. The panelists um, uniformly had interesting things to bring to the table. So I'm very pleased with the way it, it all turned out. Um, and you know, at this point, um, I'm already starting to think about next year. Uh, so I've been writing notes about uh, possible topics for next year's conference based in large part on the conversations that we had uh, over the past day and a half. And I'll just share a few of the topics that um, I'm already thinking about, um, you know, that we'll have more conversations about and your feedback would be, would be useful. Um, so one of the points that Morris made and that I commented on briefly was, you know, so what are the, what's, what's happening in, with regard to the measurement of mortgage risk at the federal agencies that have some responsibility for this. So uh, as I already indicated, I think next year we're going to have people at a minimum from the Fed who do this as their job. And I know this work is going on. It would be useful to see what they're looking at and also to um, share our views about whether that's uh, a sufficient set of um, measures to really have a comprehensive understanding of what's going on. Um, we heard also about the um, ongoing development of additional databases, very comprehensive uh, national databases on mortgages and on properties um, that are, have been in the works for a while, particularly on the mortgage side. I think it would be useful to have the people who are responsible for those projects, particularly the National Mortgage Database, to come back and give us an update on where things stand and when that information is going to be available to the public. Um, there was some discussion about the importance of second liens. Susan talked about that. Um, I think it would be useful to have some discussion next year about risk management surrounding second liens um, that we haven't really talked about very much today. Um, and I think it would also be useful, and I'm sure we're going to do something like this, to really continue to, to monitor the progress on a number of initiatives that are already underway and that were uh, discussed to, um, over the past day and a half. So I'm sure that um, the work that we're doing on land valuation, uh, Ed and I are doing with Morris and Sankar Boca at FNC, will have pushed forward um, uh, by another year, <laughs> uh, by the time we convene next October. And I, I think that what, what we'd really like to have are these um, timely index updates for each of the metro areas so that we can talk about what, not only what happened historically, but where we see um, things as of the conference and, you know, the trends that are in place and whether there appear to be significant hotspots. Um, I'm hopeful that um, the wealth building home loan will achieve greater market prominence than it has already. I mean, Ed and I are very pleased with the penetration in the market we have so far, but honestly, it's still tiny. Um, and hopefully by next year, there will be more to report about uh, market acceptance of the loan. Um, uh, following on on some of Ed DeMarco's comments during his keynote address and also during the last panel, um, it would be very interesting to know more about the state of development of the infrastructure that he talked about 
that is really a precondition for a well-functioning private um, label mortgage-backed securities market. It would also be useful to hear more about what progress has been made on um, trying to design and implement the appraisal of the future, the last panel that we had. Ed gave, I thought, a very nice um, example of the kinds of information that would be useful to have in um, an appraisal to actually provided valuable information about um, market risk um, and showed as well that it's not that hard to collect a lot of that information. We didn't do it in an automated way. We, you know, it was very piecemeal. We pulled things together from lots of sources. But the fact that we could do it um, means that it could be done in a much more automated way without too much effort. And I guess the last um, topic that I, I think will be part of the conference next year in some way will be a further discussion about the consumer-facing information that we talked about uh, in one of our panels this time, um, you know, with regard to the rent versus buy decision and FICO scores. I mean, that seems like a very fruitful um, area for more work to be done so that consumers who are thinking about entering the housing market can do so in a much more informed way. So those are the items that are on my list for next year, and, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ed. Well, thank you also to S Steve and Joan for all the hard work in putting this conference together. Um, I'd like to make uh, one, general, one general observation and a, a sort of an action plan. Uh, first general observation, as I heard uh, the uh, Yang Ling's presentation, Steve's presentation, some of our National Mortgage Risk Index information, some of the other the MGIC information, uh, when we did the, the um, uh, sales price impact for FHA and did a regression, and when Ed starts talking about regressions, you know we're in trouble. And, and so did a regression, and Steve said uh, in his understated way, it's unusual to get a regression this crisp. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really comes back to a theme that has been brought up throughout the conference, which is when you have a lot of data, and, and we tend to look at full censuses of data, as we've talked about, uh, or when you have a very good sample of data, and the data that you have is actually reliable, then you can actually figure out what's going on, you know, if you ask the right questions, do the right analysis, but you have to have that to start with. And much of what is done or passes for research is using flawed data. And, um, and so uh, I, I think we, we need to make sure that we continue moving uh, the ball forward uh, and make sure that we've got crisp results in our analysis. I think we'll have a lot less, a lot easier time getting to conclusions if we can have these uh, crisp uh, results. In terms of next steps, uh, uh, we, we were at this point last year, I remember it well as the, in the closing panel, uh, we've accomplished some of the things that um, were set out as a, a goal. If you may, those of you who were here last year, you know there was a general agreement that the current appraisal process is fundamentally flawed. A lot of different reasons for that, and we've, a lot of those have been discussed here today. And I think we've moved the ball forward substantially in that. There was a lot of discussion that the people who were at the conference really had it to some extent in their power to sort of start addressing it, uh, be it lenders or appraisers or. I, uh, you know, I, my, my, my confidence in federal regulators actually undertaking any of this is well under control. Uh, <laughs> and it's based on the history of looking at literally 80 years of housing policy in the United States and the twists and turns that take place in that policy for politically expedient purposes, um, which can be documented, you know, beyond any uh, question. And... Uh, so the first step is to continue, and this is something we do at AEI uh, at the center, continue to work with and encourage private data collectors and suppliers in providing the kind of data that would be useful to, for example, do the, uh, you know, a, a, um, a mortgage lending value appraisal, uh, one that, you know, talks about intrinsic or sustainable uh, prices. Uh, 
and by the way, and there was some comment about this in one of the questions, we're not asking appraisers to take out a crystal ball. That is not what they do in Germany. They're very explicit that they're not doing that. What we're asking an appraiser to do is look at a bunch of information that can be easily, I mean, and logically pulled together, particularly if the private sector knew people were looking for it, um, that would allow you to look at the sustainability of this particular property at this particular price. And that's why I asked Andreas the question. Um, if you've got a 30% increase in nominal prices in metropolitan areas in Germany uh, in six years, and, you know, which is extraordinary for Germany, that means that some areas are experiencing a 60% or 80% increase. Um, then is the mortgage lending value process actually working? Are people saying, well, wait a minute, the sales price is not really the value that you should lend on? And Andreas's answer was yes, that, that is what's happening. And, um, but that's what should happen. And again, they're not doing it based on a crystal ball. They're basically saying this value that we're getting today isn't consistent with the fundamentals that you know we've seen in the past and isn't consistent with the trend lines we've seen in the past and therefore there's need for caution is it sustainable that this value will be there for the 30 years um, so the second is uh, this idea of, of um, that was talked about in 1934 of a data repository for appraisal data uh, has obviously been kicked around for 81 years uh, off and on mostly off um, I happen to think it should be an independent or, or utility. Uh, I, I look again to Germany. Um, the, you know, this is a private company that Andreas works for. It's a subsidiary of the Association of Mortgage Bankers, which in Germany happens to be all depository institutions. Um, and and uh, 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 not, uh, so when they say mortgage banker, they mean depository institution because you have to be a depository institution to be a mortgage banker. Um, but it's a private entity that collects all this data and does all this research. Uh, there is no such equivalent in the United States, and, and there should be, and it should be done privately, um, and I would challenge you know, those here um, that are in uh, uh, the business of lending and have access to the appraisals and private companies uh, that also to figure out how to create um, you know, such a, a, a database and utility that, that's available. I know Joan tried that um, a couple of years ago and, and was unable to get um, any consensus and funding for it. Um, it's not an easy task, but uh, again, asking the federal government to do it um, is fraught with problems. I mean, it, because we know where it ends up, in my opinion. Um, third, um, I think uh, there needs to be an acceptance by some risk takers and uh, we were just having a discussion about what's a risk take in the mortgage business. So I start with Fannie and Freddie are not because they have no capital. So therefore, they, they, they are repositories of risk, but they're not risk takers. The taxpayer is a risk taker in that case. Uh, you can go down the list of the federal agencies, uh, FHA, et cetera, and you're in the same boat. So it's the taxpayer. So you, you can't go to the taxpayer and ask for something. Um, so there's no point in going to Fannie and Freddie because they're not risk takers. Uh, you end up. Um, with, for good or, or ill, the banks being the risk takers. Now, they're not necessarily fully on the credit risk at all, although they do have a substantial exposure, 16%, I think, of all the mortgages in the United States they own as whole loans, um, and then the second mortgages, which are another 4 or 5%. So that's a substantial chunk of the business. Uh, but secondly, they are the ones that are risk takers, as they found out belatedly, uh, with the federal agencies. Um, when the federal agencies decide that they need a, a fall guy, they're going to look for the deep pockets. Um, and the deep pockets aren't the largely the non-banks. The shadow banking are not the deep pockets. Um, and therefore, the banks are the logical, you know, it's the Willie Sutton rule. And therefore, in the land of the blind, the one man eyed is king, one, one eyed man is king, and therefore the banks are king as risk takers. Now, they may not be the biggest risk takers in the world, uh, but they're it. Um, there's nobody else. Uh, you got mortgage insurers is another. You know, they're true risk takers um, on their s slice of the market. Um, but again, you need, in my opinion, you need front end risk takers. Uh, trying to get the back end people to do this, they don't even have access to the appraisals and a lot of the other stuff. And so maybe they'll be late, you know, joiners later on. But to the front end, the front end risk takers are the banks and uh, the mortgage insurers. Um, and then following up what Steve said, the consumer facing. 
Uh, I think we've heard a lot of information yesterday and today th that, and given technology and given the, the internet, um, the, the top 20% of the population is going to have access to this data come hell or high water. It's happening. They can go to Zillow today and get a walkability score. They can go to Zillow today and get a school score. You can go all over the place. Uh, Trulia, you name it, uh, uh, the other one, Redfin. I mean, there's all this stuff out there. Um, and they're going to do that. Um, they're going to do the investigation. And they're going to pick the places that are, by, you know, they're going to intuitively figure out where those places are. Um, and companies are going to be providing the data, and they're going to figure out, um, you know, where these land use restrictions, they, they, they intuitively know where they are, and they may look at those as positives because it's going to keep their house prices really jacked up. Um, but the, the low income, the moderate income, they are not in a position to do that. They are going to get creamed once again because they're going to get left out of that information cycle um, because they don't have the ability to sort of process all that uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, you know, they're busy working and stuff. It's not that, you know, higher income people are just have time to go do this stuff and they're familiar with the web and all of that. They're just going to go do it. They're incented to do it. And, um, and so unless we start democratizing some of this information, and which means the, the mortgage industry has to start taking it seriously. Uh, I think we are setting, uh, once again, uh, low income and, and middle income buyers up for the fall because they're going to be left out of this real valuable information about what's going on. Uh, the, f the government's not going to give them this information. I mentioned that yesterday. I, I don't believe the CFPB has done, in my opinion, nothing to provide tr truly useful information of the type that we've talked about the last day and a half. They, it's not on their radar screen. Um, so those are the sort of the four action steps. Um, it sounds to some extent like what we said last year, but I do think we've made a lot of progress on a lot of these areas. We have a lot more detail to, um, you know, pin uh, on things. Um, and I think once again, it behooves us to actually um, you know, get with some of the stakeholders that are appropriate to each of these four areas and start really moving uh, the, the, the ball forward so that next year when together, we're together, we can actually report on progress specifically on these four areas. So that, that's my uh, closing. Uh, remember next year we've got um, Save the Date, October 5th, 6th. We'll be in our new building up the street for the fifth annual International Conference on Housing Risk. Um, anybody have a question? We've got a couple of minutes and then we'll adjourn, but any questions? Yeah, uh, we're in the back there. Yeah. Reed Bennett, zero to 60. So um, I, I this conference was amazing. The people here are amazing. Thank you, Ed, inviting me the day before. I jumped on a plane. And, uh, but I wonder if I could uh, offer the following as a gift to AEI for how terrific this was. I think uh, Professor Wachter was talking about the fact that there's no individual number for each parcel in this country. And as far as I know, every parcel does have a number. It just doesn't have a, you know, national number. So um, I would say, and this I'd do for free, uh, we could go out for an RFP if everybody in this room would agree to uh, go to the people with the budget to uh, buy a subscription to this uh, database, and that uh, you know we could ha we could have something extremely and very very complete uh, concrete that I think people would pay for. So I don't know if that that makes any sense or not. I haven't read the paper that says why it's so difficult to put this uh, database together, but I know if every parcel has a unique number and then that the necessity is for a national number then we'll take we'll aggregate those and we'll put them into an, an, a national database and at least we'll have something that might work so comment or say that's not going to work or go back to where you come come from I'm fine with that if I may uh, and, and I, I wish I could relay to you the name of the organizations but I understand there are at least three organizations who have created a national real property data unique identifier. 
I can get that answer for you. I think the problem is that there are three competing and then nobody's put a stake in the ground and said, oh, this is it. But part of the challenges uh, are that that unique identifier needs to be three-dimensional so that when you have a, a high rise, you have a, a, you know, the northwest corner on the 14th floor of that condo building. Well, what I would suggest is all profits to AEI. So oh. maybe that would be, maybe that would be a uh, reason that we could all come together on something concrete like that. Well, thank you for for that uh, suggestion. We'll follow up on that. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for this conference. Uh, as I asked uh, that question before, then those are important to put in your file, in the record. And uh, for through all this uh, conference, I didn't hear a mention, how do you evaluate the credibility involved in the uh, settlement of a house? Not just information, I say the attorney should be responsible for the uh, where the attorney re re represent the customer or home buyers, and uh, whether there should be a trustee, and uh, whether there should be a co auditor if something go wrong, and uh, whether the trustee sh should be a real person rather than a phony person, and uh, how the judges or the, the co personnel mishandle the court cases. All this is a, a long way, and I know one of the panelists said, do mention system problem, and, but the system is so wide, and we have to really take every detail to answer this kind of question. For instance, a consumer or homeowner, if they got this problem, which agency should be responsible rather than everybody say, I didn't care, I didn't know, I cannot handle that. Or just uh, your complaint should be on the file in the public record rather than you put on the file, then they erase it or they even change the content. And uh, whether the internet hacker, they, they change all the creditor or something, they, they change your credit rating. Uh, of course, that is false, but that will be not just influence your reputation, but they also take away all your resources because they take advantage of people. So I just wonder, this is real basic. If our society is fairness or really based on the essence of capitalism, now capitalism is really a failure. But you know I mean, if it's really based on fairness, I think all the information Can will I be- Can I attempt to answer that? The last, what, last uh, statement, I mean, no, all no, this- We got it, we're, just, we're closing. Uh, I, mean, we I mean, just last statement. I mean, with all this information, it's, whether there's a place where you analyze everything, should be automatically Okay. Real work. So okay. We're, if you we're, have I'm a sorry. house, I'm sorry. We're, if we're, you have a you house, your first question, uh, Joan's going to respond to it, and then we're going to close the conference. Thank in, you. In, in two words, accountability and transparency. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. The conference is closed.